603. We're gonna we're gonna get started. Yeah. Welcome everybody. Welcome to meeting members. Uh, good evening. Buenas noches. It's nice to see so many people at our board meeting. I know this important conversations that we're gonna have tonight. I wanted to start tonight by acknowledging that it's the fourth night of Hanukkah. <laughs> I have my little there. I was gonna light it for you guys to see if I can bring us some light. For, for tonight and also acknowledge that tonight is, uh, today is the winter solstice and the winter solstice is an opportunity to have a rebirth is what a lot of people believe. So it can be an opportunity to notice what uh, what limiting beliefs we have or unsupported habitus, habits and uh, that we wish to leave behind and embrace uh, the new aspects of ourselves and what we want to elevate and and, and see clearly our journey ahead. So with that said, I wanna start by thanking all our staff from our, cause it's the end of the year. We're not gonna see you guys until next year, <laughs> whether it's Zoom or in person. So we wanna start by thanking our staff, bus drivers, custodians, kitchen staff, teachers, core staff, administrators, all everybody at Washington Central Unified Union School District. On, be part, on behalf of the board, we want to say thank you for the immense work of, that you do every day for our communities. Uh, we also want to offer gratitude, gratitude to our community that support not just our budget, but also supports our humanity and justice efforts. Uh, as the board continues to shift through year round budgeting and and continues to focus on student outcomes. Uh, we started early. We want to start as early as possible our budgeting process. And intentionally, the board set some parameters uh, that allowed our administrators to be creative and be leaders and dreamers. The idea of tonight is to make sense of the future. Uh, what are the needs? What are the challenges that lie ahead? Everything that we discussed tonight is informational and is not set in stone yet. It allows us to be responsible and ask ourselves, are we structured the way that we need to be structured in order to best serve all our kids? The answer to that question is not to take or make That's any the immediate change. Yeah? Oh. Brian. Uh, but the information will inform our work to engage our communities as we continue the year round budgeting and start our strategic planning. There is no question that it is a challenging budget. This year and the next years to come are gonna be challenging too. We are committed as a board and as administrators to bringing oxygen into the system. And that's what we're doing today. We're brainstorming together. Uh, what role can we play and how can we open ourselves for future opportunities that we believe in? So. The last thing I wanted to say was like, please don't feel like this is the last time that you give us input. I know that tonight there's going to be a lot of information. Please feel free to email us. I wonder if there's somebody that is not muted. <laughs> I'm getting some noise, but so feel free to email us. We'll process the information that 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 we that we received tonight. We'll process any information that we receive from from us. We we have shared with you our schedule. If necessary, we'll we'll add another budgeting meeting. We'll see if that's at all possible with the, with what we have. But it's a you know a doing budget and especially the way that we're trying to do it around budgeting is is a, a live thing. So it's not set on stone. We're continue to examine. We do need to have a budget in January, but um, let's brainstorm together tonight. I wanted to move now into in uh, adjusting a couple of things in the agenda. I know I did the reception of guests and I just needed to get this, this out to make sure that we are all present here today. We all have busy schedules is the holidays are coming so just take a breath we're all here for the kids let's break let's do this together we uh, i can't think of better people to do it together between our administrators and the community it, you know we have what it takes so let's be kind to each other and let's get it done uh, now we i wanted to suggest a couple of adjustments to agenda first uh, move public comments as part of the community, because we are having a budget forum. So let's do the public comments that are, that are for the budget after we all have had a chance to, to see the presentation and have the same context and information. 
if you are here and have a public comment that is not about the budget, by all means, uh, you can do it right now. If the public comment is about the budget, let's do that after the presentation. It also just allows us to all have context uh, when we're, uh, especially for board members, we're all seeing this information for the first time. Today, the presentation, we've been talking about trends, we've set parameters, and we had asked our administrators to do really hard work. So uh, we want to make sure that we have a, um, we have the time to absorb that and then also hear your your comments and then we will move into board uh, operations after we have finalized uh, the community part. And one last thing, uh, we will want to I want to move a uh, uh, for uh, let me see the budget, uh, the fund balance uh, projections that are right now six point one two move them up to 4.3 so that it informs, so all of our budget discussion is together as opposed to waiting until the very end to look at that. So, so move that to 4.3 and then education quality will become 4.4 and so on. It, could I have thumbs up from board members if they're okay with those changes? I, okay, I see thumbs up and nodding head. So I'm assuming that's okay. It, public, if there's somebody here that has a comment that is not about the budget, you're welcome to raise your hand. Otherwise, you would have, you know, if we have too many people, we'll have a minute and a half per person. If we don't have too many people that want to comment, we can be a little bit more freeform. But with that said, uh, oh, I Elliot, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Floor. Um, I, I'll be brief. I just wanted to make a request. This doesn't have to do with a specific budget item, but yeah. in the presentation, it would be really helpful to the community members to hear what the program impacts will be of what is being proposed budget wise. So we know what the impact will be at our school in terms of staff, in terms of program, in terms of courses. Okay. I don't know if it's part of the program, part of the presentation already, but if if not, that would be really helpful. Okay. Thank you, Elliot. Yeah. All right. Okay. With that, I'm gonna uh, give it to Megan and Suzanne. Is that okay? Yes, that is. Thank you, Floor. I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me a second. Okay. So I think folks are pretty used to the hearing people say this, but I can't see you. So um, I am going to, we're about to present a lot of information. So I, I recognize that I am going to keep going through. We have ample time for comments um, at the end. Um, and Floor will interrupt me if there is sort of a desperate question for clarity that we can't keep going without. But other than that, I'm going to keep going through. Um, and I also just wanted to kind of expand on, on, what, on what Floor started off saying. Um, and some, some folks have heard me say this before, uh, but as we start off, I just want to acknowledge again, this is a hard time for all of us to be having budget conversations. Um, it's a hard time to be thinking about it, um, we're distracted by the holidays, um, and it's a lot to process. So as much as we try to engage in this earlier, um, the reality is we rarely have the full picture of our budget as early as we would like. Um, so. We know this, the board knows this, the leadership team knows this. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that that the leadership team spent a significant portion of their time over the past month, really, um, working to bring this information back to the board so that they can make um, a good decision for, for our students. This is just a reminder slide. Um, people are pretty familiar with this at this point, but that orange is where we are in the process. Um, we are here to look at a second draft of the budget. The first draft of the budget that everyone saw in November was a budget that would offer the same services. It's a level service budget, so it would offer the same thing that is happening this year at next year's projected cost. And so today is giving a budget in within the parameters that the board has set. So I will show, will show you what that is. Um, and our hope for tonight 
really is to give the board as clear an understanding as possible of our path to a budget within the parameters that they set. Um, we want to then make sure they have enough information to be able to give us direction around next steps. And to Floor's point earlier, um, it's direction to inform the third draft of the budget. Um, it's not, uh, things are not finalized now. Our hope is that we give everyone the information that they need. Um, we hope to do that by starting with a review of our current budget realities. Some of this you've heard as a theme over the past few months, but some of this information is new. We'll try to give some regional perspectives um, and we'll try to really lean in and look at some of our own realities as we move forward for the next few years. We also want to be really clear with the board about what the leadership process was to get to this draft. Um, remind the board of the lenses that we've chosen to look through that, that the board has supported us in doing. Um, what the opportunities were for input and what the themes were from that input. And then what are our paths to further budget adjustments. Then we'll present the budget and that does include details so that there's some clarity around what the reductions are to achieve the parameters. Um, and then the board will discuss and the board will, as Floor said, hear from the community to do that. So that's what we hope to do today. And just a reminder, these are the parameters. This is the direction that the board gave to the leadership team in November. Um, after presenting the budget uh, and the impacts of that level funded budget, and just as a reminder, our level service budget came in at about a 9.7% increase. Um, so the, the board asked us to pre present a budget that continues to offer and further develop our MLSS that includes an initiative to achieve significant improvement in proficiency for historically underserved students. The board wants us to remain under the spending threshold as it existed previously. That number is about $22,200. Um, the board asked us to bring a net impact of expense budget under 6%. So that is part of what you, were, what you will see. Um, and a reminder that that number is a little over a million dollars. That's the magnitude of reductions. Um, the board wanted us to develop contingency plans for how we might approach expense reductions. And lastly, the board asked us to be creative. Um, and so we'll spend some time talking about what that meant um, and creativity. This part the board has heard many times before, but this is just a reminder that all of these resources we are discussing are so that we can achieve our mission and that we can uh, move forward the three areas of priority work. And that's academic achievement, safe and healthy schools and humanity and, just humanity and justice. So we added this slide um, because we wanna make sure the, the board is clear about what is in this budget to support its priority of um, supporting underserved students. Um, we wanna make sure it's clear to you that the budget we're discussing tonight, even with the proposed reductions, includes an effort to, um, to achieve this parameter. Um, our budget, <clears throat> excuse me, includes 14 intervention positions across the district, um, it includes support for district-wide professional learning, some of the areas in lots of areas, quite frankly, but some of the areas specifically related to this parameter is early literacy, effective instructional practices, and high quality intervention. It supports our humanity and justice work, and um, that work is critical to serving traditionally underserved students. Um, and it includes support for our multi-layered system of support. And I think that's important for the board to see, even though what we've been charged to do is show you reductions, we wanna make sure that the board understands what is in the budget. So we're gonna start with some information about what's happening around us. Um, and to start, I'm gonna turn this slide over to Suzanne um, to talk a little bit about statewide budget realities. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, in addition to the state statewide budget realities, we have a number of local realities that are, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. <laughs> um, 
it may also be helpful for the board to consider what makes up the majority of our budget. What are the major cost drivers? This is important because when we think about adjustments to programming, it becomes pretty clear where most of our resources are focused and what we do and do not have control over. Some things to consider include salary and benefits. Uh, they're up about, uh, they're, they're about 80 plus percent of our budget. They're required services for special education and capital improvement investments to maintain the health and safety of staff and students in our buildings. We also want to remember some of the budget realities that exist prior to any changes in programming or services include declining enrollment, staffing shortages, and changes to the way that Vermont funds special education needs, uh, specifically in Act 173. Uh, inflation and economic realities here uh, include school budgets averaging an 8.52% increase uh, across the state and the CPI index coming in at 7% at the end of October. So CPI is uh, basically an inflation measurement. And then uh, numbers from the December 1 tax letter uh, from the tax commissioner. Last year, during the budget development process, the board requested that the use of fund balance as a revenue be discontinued for this budget. Uh, and we are also looking out ahead to impacts from the uh, reduction of ARP ESSER funding. Thank you, Suzanne. I think, you know, these are always present for us, and I would. What I would add this year is that they're particularly impactful for our budget. Um, and it's also true of our neighbors. Uh, these are things that everyone is um, concerned about. In addition to those realities, we have a number of local realities that we're gonna talk quite a bit of time tonight about. And perhaps the biggest impact that we are looking at currently and also over time is our declining enrollment. Um, I will show a slide in a second that's a little bit more detailed and provides information about that. But this has immediate impact for us budgetarily, and it has long-term impact. Um, we know that there is still uncertainty around the impacts of funding changes in Vermont. Um, in this budget that you are looking at, um, we, we now receive our special education funding in a different way. Our special education funding used to increase if our special ed spending increased. That is no longer true. We now receive a, a census-based grant for special ed dollars. And in this second draft of the budget, our special ed costs increased and our revenue does not increase in this new funding model. So that's an example of uncertain impacts. Um, in another year, so not this current budget season, but we will be impacted by the change in how pupils are weighted. That's part of how Vermont funds education. These are things that are gonna impact us over time and impact us right now. Um, as Suzanne said, the sunset of ARP ESSER funds in FY25 is something that we need to start thinking about today. Um, if we aren't careful, then we're sort of, prolonging a problem that we're then going to have to face in a year. We have a significant portion of our budget that is being funded by money that will just plain go away in FY25. We know that we have workforce challenges. We have vacant positions. We know the kind of pressure that puts on our system. We have uh, limitations in our ability to bring in new hires. Um, those challenges persist. Um, and we have structural limitations. And what we mean by that is, is how we are organized as a district impacts what our budget is. We're gonna hear more about that as well. So this slide is just a little bit more detail about our enrollment realities. So this looks back three years and it looks forward three years. And uh, there's a lot of numbers on here, but if you focus on the right-hand side, which is just our full district enrollment, we are declining significantly. Um, the projections that existed five or six years ago have played out. So we are consistent with what we were projected to be um, a number of years ago. Um, the board has seen this information quite a few times and in various formats um, throughout this budget season and in years past. Um, 
But this slide really summarizes the biggest impacts that we are facing moving forward. Um, this decline over this six year, six, seven year period represents about a 23% decline in enrollment. Um, it does appear to level off after those um, few years to the extent that we can um, reliably project after three to five years, um, but this is significant. And just to kind of illustrate for folks a little bit more about what that means, um, this is a slide that Stephen put together. Um, so I'm going to turn it over briefly to him to comment a little bit. But this is just to give the board some information about what does this mean for U32 in particular in a number of years. So Stephen, I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, thank you, Megan. So um, when you look at this slide, you're looking at um, fiscal year 23 is the our current year. And so this is the five year projection for U32. And what you see is um, a school that the middle school shrinks, as you see, from 229 to 165. Um, and what's hard to understand sometimes about the high school is that while we may have an enrollment that says that there are 499 students in the building, as it says for physical year 23. Um, it's not 499 kids in the building. We have students who attend the tech center, which we is a great opportunity for them that we want to continue to support. We have kids who are able to do early college as well. And what those do is those reduce the overall numbers that we serve on a daily basis um, in all of our classes. They still provide, we still provide some services to those students, um, but they do not take a full complement of classes with us or, or any classes at all, but they still have um, school counselors and things like that. We also take in, um, when you see that plus 10 tuition, um, we take in students from uh, some schools that have school choice still, and those students add to our overall student body as well. We're still estimating um, that we'll get about 10 tuition students a year that adds to our total. Um, but you also see that over time, because of the decline in enrollment that we see overall, our school is going to shrink um, in student numbers by about a little over 20 percent um, in those five years, with the biggest change happening actually in physical year 26. And, um, and that's when we drop. Uh, pretty significantly, um, and then that will play out through the high school um, from the middle school. So it just gives us a good idea of a school that is actually built for 950 students will have about 500 students in the building. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and I think we wanted the board to see that information because it's really relevant to the structural piece. And the, the other thing that I would add is if that will be the reality at the high school in FY26, it means those small class sizes are here in our elementary schools right now. Um, and I think that's that's important. So, so we're gonna move from budget context and budget realities to our approach to development. Um, so the board can, some of this, some of this you've heard before, um, some of it is um, the next step. Uh, but this is how the leadership team approached the development of this second draft budget. Um, the first piece I want to remind the board about is these three lenses. Um, the leadership team started having conversations back in October, um, long before the parameters were set, but knowing that it was probably going to be a challenging budget season um, and that we needed a more objective way to approach the budgets. Um, and so these are our agreements about the lenses we would use to think about uh, the budget. And we have shared this with the board, but um, we wanna focus on what do Vermont education quality standards say about how we're resourced. We wanna focus on whether or not we're distributing our resources um, equitably across our system. And are we taking into account student need? And all of those things sort of keep at the center of it, the work, our priority work, academic achievement, safe and healthy schools, humanity and justice. Um, so those are our lenses. And a little bit more about why we started with education quality. Um, education quality standards represent Vermont's current requirements for how to resource our schools for quality education. We wanted to emphasize quality experiences for students. Um, if we look at things through an EQS lens, we are able to apply reductions, frankly, universally versus school-based, um, based only on individual decisions. 
It has a greater focus on equity because it's applied consistency and it gives us a more objective baseline um, and it's data driven. Um, so for us, what this looked like is that we as a leadership team spent time looking at our current realities, looking at our enrollment, um, looking at how we currently compare to ed quality standards, how we currently distribute our resources and identified common agreements to use when we approach the reduction within our own buildings. Um, this brought some consistency of approach to the reductions. Um, and that consistency of approach doesn't exist when we use a method of reductions that's more of a budget exercise. And what I mean by that is a math exercise by taking the desired reduction, dividing it up and tasking individual buildings. Um, that's a very different way of approaching it. There are limitations to every approach to budgeting, and we recognize that. So the limitations that we would highlight for this is a lot related to our structure. So although we largely do distribute our resources equitably, the reality is that very small schools tend to use more resource compared to the proportion of students they serve. That means that it means two things, uh, two main things. It means a lot of things, but the two biggest are that our largest school shoulders the largest proportion of reductions. And which we will talk more about when we talk about creativity, it means that some of the most impactful changes we could make to ed quality adjustments in our smallest schools would require structural change. We get to a point where we can't do it anymore within our current structure. So we understand that it, that there are limitations. A little bit more information about process. We wanna just remind the board of kind of the timeline of engaging, um, even though the budget timeline is imperfect and we have a chance to reflect on it every year. Um, this is what this year's timeline was. Um, we, all we enter every budget season already knowing the work that we have to do. We know that we have district plans. We know that we have statewide requirements requirements. We know that we have a board focus on the achievement gap, right? So that we know coming into the process. Um, we've had a number of opportunities to engage staff, um, both through survey and through faculty meetings and kind of distributing information. Um, the board has had community forums. Um, we've, for the first time this year, which I'm excited about, and I recognize that it's only a first step, um, but your student council at U32 has a finance committee itself, um, and we've just started conversations with them about how we can engage with them. Um, I would say that's a work in progress and we wanna keep doing it, um, but that's exciting. And then obviously the board's more formalized budget process. There are some common themes from all of that engagement. The two biggest ones are a, a desire to make sure that our budget supports student learning and supports opportunities for students um, across the board. And this is community, this is faculty, staff, this is board. We want good quality first instruction. We want a really high quality workforce. And we know that that's hard right now. Um, we wanna make sure that we continue our intervention systems, really focusing on academics and social emotional learning. And we wanna maximize opportunity. So this, this played out in a number of different ways. Folks wanna make sure that kids equitably across the system have access, not just to the basics, but to a robust um, education. Okay, so as we move into this part of the process, I, I just sort of wanna acknowledge um, that this was and continues to be hard. This is hard work. Um, I would say that the leadership team in all of our conversations when we're just talking about reductions. We know there are people behind those reductions and, and that's tough. It's not just an intellectual exercise. But I also know that in the course of our conversations when we started to be able to lean into the creativity part um, and think instead about not what we're chipping away at but what we could do, um, I would say even just thinking about our being in our conference room, the tone of the room changed. Um, so the tone of the room changes when we can think more about what we're providing for students in a really robust way. Um, and, and Flora talked a lot about this in her intro as well. Um, and I think that's important. And uh, I think it's important to start off this section of the presentation reminding everyone of that. 
Um, there's a few different places where um, our leadership team may unmic and jump in. And so just so folks know that that's true. Um, but that that's that's what we're that's what we're going to talk about right now is how did we get to this budget and and here's uh the information that the board and the community needs about what's in this budget so again with those three lenses this first draft focused on staying within education quality recommendations this first draft is only showing you adjustments within buildings so this is before we think about creative ways of structuring, right? And it still provides quality education and allows us to move forward with the board priorities. So this, we're gonna show this information in two different ways. Um, the first one is just overviewing the reductions. Um, there is an addition actually, but overviewing the impact by FTE by department. I'm going to pause for a second so you can read through that slide. And those reductions in total, um, including the addition of health educator FTE, which we need to be able to implement our health education program, that represents about $855,000 of the total of a million. So it's sort of clear right off the bat that this, these, these impacts that we're showing you don't get all the way to 6%. This is the information by school. I'm going to leave this up for a few minutes and I'll speak to it in a second. Um, the total at the bottom is the same, but that takes those same FTE and shows you where they are located across the system. So I'll pause for a second and then I'll speak for this. So one of the questions that we know folks will have in looking at this impact is why two of our schools are not represented on this list of impacts. Um, and I want to remind the board that the reason why is when we lead with education quality standards, Berlin and East Montpelier already fall within education quality standards. If we were to reduce, it would cause them to fall out of education quality standards. And that was not a reduction that was in keeping with how we've agreed to do this. And I also just want to reiterate that large school challenge. And that's, that's demonstrated by um, you know, U32. When you have the biggest proportion of the budget, you also shoulder a bigger proportion of the reductions. If we were to reduce further, it can't be done at the elementary level without changing structure. So that's just, I'm sort of anticipating that that's a question the board will have. Okay. So the next slide, Suzanne is going to go through. This is the numbers associated with those reductions that we just shared. So the expenditures are the amount the district plans to spend. Revenues are the money the district anticipates receiving to offset the expenditures. The net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by property taxes. The increase in the local education spending for budget draft number one was 9.71% uh, from $28,821,017 in FY23 to $31,619,027 in FY24. As described in previous slides, the leadership team made expenditure reductions of $855,218 but increases in other areas, primarily necessary changes in special education services, caused a net change of $611,008 from draft number one to draft number two. The percentage calculation used for the increase in local education spending is a comparison of the increase to the prior year's local education spending of $28,821,017. This percentage increase is 7.59% for budget draft number two. 
Page seven in the packet is a comparative budget summary that gives you a breakdown of the changes in the budget by category. In order to get this budget to a 6% increase in net education spending, the expenditures must be reduced further by $457,742, or the school board could authorize the use of fund balance to use as a revenue to offset the increase. Uh, this is a slide that describes our preliminary tax rate projections. The current tax rate calculation uses the property yield $15,479 from the tax commissioner's December 1 letter. This amount was derived using information that uh, the forecasted year-over-year -year rate of growth in education spending would be 8.52%, which we spoke about earlier. This is substantially higher than the actual rate of growth over the last several fiscal years. This property yield may change during the legislative session. The final figures will be set by the legislature and approved by the governor. The equalized homestead tax rate is the rate a district would have if all properties were assessed at fair market value. The common level of a Appraisal is the ratio of each town's listed values versus the state's listed value. The state's listed value is comprised of actual sales, generally averaged over three years. The state's fair market value is the equalized education grand list. The higher the CLA, the lower the tax rate. If any of these CLAs decrease, the tax rates will increase. The estimated tax rates pr project the education tax rates seen on a property tax bill of a resident homeowner in the individual towns. The initial equalized pupil estimate provided by the AOE is a decrease of 3.01% from 1,423.57 to 1,380.71. This number is likely to change again with draft number three as the AOE will be sending an updated version at the end of December. The town CLAs and the state's final property yield per $1 tax rate will all likely change. The local common level of appraisal used to calculate the estimated tax rates for each town should be known in January. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we always realize that's a lot of numbers. Uh, Vermont education finance is complicated. Um, but one of the big takeaways of this is just how volatile the tax rate is and how disconnected it can become from what we're actually spending. So that, that's the biggest takeaway for the board is it's part of why we have to be prepared for fluctuations in either direction, honestly. So... We're gonna lean in a little bit on the creativity parameter um, and give some information to the board that's specific to this. Um, and it's important for the board to know that the reason this, this creative thinking is important, besides the fact that you asked us to do it, um, is because in a sense, we've taken within building reductions as far as we can, um, and if we wanted to get to 6%, we would either need to change our structures or we would be um, impacting services. And so different structures would allow us to maintain and expand instructional opportunities for students. This is that part that I, I started with by saying, this is when the tone of the room changed, when we can start focusing our conversations on what do we want for all of our students and what's the right structure that would allow us to provide it? That's when this conversation started to feel invigorating and not just about cutting. Um, the other reason why we're focused on creativity is that our long-term enrollment projections require it. Um, our ability is limited to be able to serve students in our structures as those numbers continue to go down. Um, and the other piece is, you know, we've we've already begun the process um, of finding people to support us in a visioning and strategic planning conversation. If we start talking about it now, we're empowering our communities to be a part of the conversation about 
what we want for our students and how we need to be organized in order to provide that. Um, and if we don't, then what we are we will do is be in this constant cycle of reacting and responding to budget realities. Um, so that's the creativity piece. Um, and before I get into sharing a little bit of some of the ideas, I don't know if any leadership team members want to jump in on this part. Megan, is it all right if I jump in? This is Kat. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, Cal is one of our smaller schools. I went to Calis. I'm embedded in this community. I don't want to see the sadness that comes from these little uh, chipping away that happens over time. That's really, really hard to see. Um, and I, you know, when I first started wrestling with this information, I was a little angry. And um, I looked at my sort of neighbors next door. Alicia knows I love her at East Montpelier. So Alicia, bear with me, girlfriend. Um, I always look at East Montpelier and I say, oh, they're so well um, resourced and it's not fair. Um, I think the last time I teased her about it, it was a Brady Bunch reference that some of you young people won't get, but Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Uh, East Montpelier always gets everything. And then I started looking at some of those hard realities that Megan and Suzanne were talking about. Smaller schools, in order to function, they have to take on more resources than um, is appropriate for our size, for our enrollment. So it's a disproportionate amount of the resources in Washington Central go to small schools like Callis. And so I had to be honest with myself and say, that's an important perspective for me to have and um, step back and say, if what I care about is not more, because I got more uh, for my kids and I feel like they're all my kids, my perspective needs to shift to what do I want for our kids? And I don't care, sorry, my phone's ringing. I just got impassioned too, darn it. Um, I want to care about all kids in Calus and Want to see who's calling my house? <laughs> so sorry. Um, one of the things that I want to get excited about isn't being stuck on thinking about what do we need to keep shaving away, but what can we start doing to be maximizing our resources across our district? We don't have to talk about closing schools. We can start talking about really being creative. What do we want for kids? What are our families? What are our communities need? And spreading our resources across all of our district. We don't have to be the same cookie cutter building pre-K to six in every elementary school. We just don't. And that does not serve our, serve our children. I'm sorry if that was a little soapboxy, but I, I felt like I just had to jump in. Is that okay, Megan? You, you're too far away to kick me under the table if I go too far. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Kat, because I think it kind of represents the, the um, potential for us to be able to have this conversation about what is right for kids and what will be right for kids long-term and how do we do that in a way that really brings input into the process. Um, so no, I appreciate that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna keep speaking to some preliminary ideas around creativity and the reason why these are not sort of formalized and have numbers associated with them is because it's for the board to understand what that could look like short or long term. And then if the board gives further direction, we would be able to flesh some of those creativity ideas out um, because that's really the core of what the, what the board's gonna wrestle with tonight. Um, there are ways to combine programming in some of our schools to rectify very small class sizes that impact our ability to provide a really quality education. One of the places that could be done is in preschool. We offer pre-K programs at all five of our elementary schools. Um, if we were to, um, in a geographically appropriate way, combine those programs, um, we would be able to create a bigger group of kids, which is a better learning experience. Um, we may even be able to expand and provide a full day program um, because we would have scale. Um, and that would also result in efficiencies, reductions. Um, there are very small class sizes at, at either end of our couple of our smallest schools. So either the sixth grade end or the kindergarten end, there are opportunities to combine those with another school. Again, without kind of going 
fully into what that could look like unless the board wants us to do that, that would also potentially reduce um, teachers and support staff. And there are bigger, you know, there are bigger conversations that we can have that that probably deserve more time than one budget season, um, but that would put us in a place where we don't have to talk about um, how much of an FTE of a school counselor or a school nurse is enough for our small schools. If we have scale, we get to just have a conversation about making sure that those schools are adequately resourced. Um, we, we, we kind of turn the conversation into what's that robust programming that we want and how do we provide that at a scale that makes sense. Um, so these are offered as starting points. Um, if the board gave direction on them um, and wanted any portion of that to be fleshed out uh, in a short-term manner, we, we could come back to that. Um, but it's really trying to, to just get ourselves thinking about um, a, just to be able to achieve the reduction that the that the board is asking for would require this kind of creativity. Um, and even if the board decides that that is not the magnitude of reduction they need in this year, it's still something that we will have to face as we move further in the process. So finally, um, just wanted to kind of remind the board, regardless of where we land in this budget process, we know that we're entering a visioning and strategic planning process that's gonna be really focused on community engagement so that we can have a picture of what do we want for our students and how should we be structured to be able to get there. And at a smaller grain size, but equally important, we know that in short or long term, we have to work to identify effective models for school counseling and nursing across our system. These are positions that were increased with ESSER money and ESSER money goes away. So whether we decide to have some of that money go away next year or the year after, the need to say, how do we distribute those positions is, um, is essential. So that's the end of me talking at you. Um, floored. I can always pop these back up if people want to reference them, but do you want me to take them, take the slides down for now? Yeah, you... Megan, if we could take the slides down just for a minute to see everybody for one second. And if we need to bring a specific slide up, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it up. But it, I, I wanted to open it up for, for questions. It, board members are going to be able to ask questions through our our operation. So if you would allow board members to have the public ask uh, questions right now, or if they have a comment to raise their hand, and we'll try to do our best to manage. Uh, so it's a vision. I hope that, you know, first, I want to thank you too, Megan and Suzanne and the leadership team. That was a lot of work. Thank you for being brave and creative and, and for being leaders. It this it was a great presentation, a lot of information and a lot that the board, you know, as a board, we own it, we ask for it and, and thank you for delivering it. it. Can I don't see any hands up yet. Don't be shy. If you have a question, it, I see one hand up one already. Tyler, before, welcome um, Tyler. This is Diane, I, before um, somebody, I, I'm in the middle of eating and it would be very rude if you had to watch that. So I will have my camera off, but please do know I'm listening and engaged in the conversation. I just don't want to subject you to my eating. No, no worries. Thanks, Dan. Okay. I just see a lot of hints up. So Mr. Tyler, welcome. It's nice to see you. Um, oh, I have a couple of other hands. So we're going to, um, I don't see a whole bunch of hands. So I'm, I don't see the need to do the minute and a half. If suddenly it goes like really crazy, we're gonna to try to stick with a minute and a half. So Tyler, uh, go ahead and then I'll, I'll move in order that I see them on my Zoom uh, link. So Elliot, you're on deck and Tyler, you have the floor. Thank you, Floor. Good evening, my name is Tyler Smith. I'm co-president of the Washington Central Educators Union, a math interventionist and instructional coach at Berlin and a parent of a Berlin fifth grader. I wanted to start with thanking you all for the work that you do on our board. As a former board member in Barrie, I understand the amount of time and responsibility that comes with being on a school board. I understand the pressure that comes with creating a budget that will pass in our towns. 
I also understand and appreciate the goals that our board has made regarding monitoring student achievement and closing achievement gaps. After hearing the board's response to draft one of the budget, I, along with many of my colleagues, was surprised to see that the board wanted to see a budget with $1 million cut. The thought that many of us had was, we don't have much in our district to cut and still function well. On the contrary, I'm sure if you asked, most WCU USD staff would say we need more resources, not less. I also wanna caution the board for making choices of reducing FTE of current positions. In Berlin, two years ago, we did this. Our music teacher left because the newly created job was less appealing, and we didn't find a music teacher until December of last year. In a year where we're still looking to fill the positions right now in December, do we really want to make some of our positions less appealing to current and prospective teachers? I realize the job at hand is not easy or simple, but I do ask all of you consider this question before making a decision. Are we making these choices because of money or are we doing what's best for all the students in our district? Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Elliot? Um, Elliot Berg in Middlesex. So I have this question about, first of all, thank you for that presentation. It was very helpful, but um, the slide that's entitled overview of impacts, it has, for example, uh, what appears to be a reduction of 0.5 uh, FTE in world language, it's 0.5 out of how much? Is there some place we can look to find where the denominator is? I don't know how much of an impact that would be on the language program at Rumney, for example. Thank you. Megan, or uh, um, who, yep. you know, I, I'll look for your guidance in who should I send the question to, but. Yeah, I, I can answer that floor. I wasn't sure if you wanted me to answer that. Um, so uh, the 0.5 would be to reduce, it's 0.5 out of 0.5 at Rumney. Thank you, Megan. Is, okay. So Jessica, Elliot, do you have another question? Is that, that answer your question? Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm the school nurse at Doty. I would like to just say that the um, presentation continually talked about historically underserved students. And those are the students that we often see in the health office. They're also the students who do not often have access to primary care. Um, we decreasing nursing FTEs would diminish supports to those students. There is a common saying in school nursing, students must be healthy to be educated and educated to be healthy. Education and health go hand in hand. What has been presented tonight is harmful when considering the whole child. And then I also have a comment from the um, Central Vermont Medical Center pediatric providers dated today. Um, the pediatrics group at Central Vermont Medical Center has greatly appreciated our collaborative relationship with local school nurses and the support they provide our mutual patients. We agree with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations for a minimum of one full-time professional school nurse in every school. We rely on our partnership with school nurses to help keep children with chronic conditions in school. At a time that we are facing unprecedented rates of pediatric mental illness and acute respiratory viruses, decreasing school nursing staffing would exasperate a crisis. Please do not hesitate to reach out with questions or concerns. Thank you for all you do for the health and well being of children in Vermont. Signed, Anna Hankins, MD, Margaret Lindsay, MD, and Nancy Sullivan, um, nurse practitioner. Katie Chasher, nurse practitioner, Catherine Cornell, DO, Gary King, MD. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Ellen Dorsey. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Uh, so I'm an instructional coach, and I've been working in that capacity since 2014. Prior to that, I taught math at U32. I find it disheartening that in the current draft of the budget, we're having to reject proactive uh, supports like instructional coaching in favor of more reactive ones. Instructional coaching supports students by supporting teachers. 
So far this year, I've personally engaged in one-to-one -one coding coaching to support 16 educators across all six of our schools, when a typical coaching load should be six teachers at a time. During the last few difficult years, when um, colleagues have been finding coaching a unique support because it's non-evaluative and it's confidential, but access has always been an issue for us with coaching. Coaching programs take time and resources to build. And over the last couple of years, we've made excellent strides to build our program, but we have more work to do. I'm finding it just extraordinarily disappointing that in this district, we're pulling the rug out from under this program, just as our investment in coaching is poised to bear fruit. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Becca Mandel. Hi, everyone. I'm Becca Mandel. I'm an alumna of Rumney and U32 and the parent of a kindergartner and a second grader at Rumney. Um, and I have just a couple, I have some questions for the board and then some sort of follow-up comments. Um, I'm curious about where the directive to cut that 1 million from the budget, sort of not just like the where, I know it came from the board, but like why, the why, I guess, um, especially, and to come in at that 6% increase when the statewide average is 8.25%, and we know costs are up, the cost of, um, you know, the consumer price index is up to 7%. So I'm curious about why we're trying to really significantly buck a, an economic reality. And it almost feels a little bit like we're trying to um, operate under a separate made up economic reality, but I'm sure there's some thought that went into that. So I'm curious to hear from the board about what that thinking was and why that seemed like the approach to take this year. Um, and then I want to sort of under, underscore something that Elliot said earlier about needing to have the denominators for all of these reductions. So we see that there's a point, point 0.1 decrease in music at Rumney. Well, what is the what is the denominator on that? Is that are we going down to zero <laughs> or are we going down from um, 0 0.5 to 0 0.4? What does that look like? I know Romney already doesn't have music in our pre-K where I believe other schools in the district have had music in pre-K. And so um, I'm curious to see, you know, how all that plays out. Um, so those denominators are really important. And I think the other key thing is to have that packet, have that presentation in the packet that went out, like, for those of us who are preparing for this meeting, I spent a lot of time reading 160 pages. I didn't read the audit. I will be honest about that. I didn't read that part. Figured you guys had that handled, but that was a lot of pages of data and being able to have um, that presentation in the packet would have been really helpful. It's something that I've asked for a lot as a narrative and the, the, um, the slideshow helped to do that, but also a written out narrative so that we can really understand um, what all of these things mean and what the impact they're gonna have on our children. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I would just want the board to hear that I, uh, as a parent in Rumney, um, do not want to see those reductions and cuts. And I'm the the framing around the creative thinking was interesting to me because I really just saw cuts in that budget that you presented. So I'm curious about what were some of the creative ways that you all thought about to keep all these incredible programs that we have, and in fact, to make it possible for other students to have access to Spanish instruction at the young age, because it's really neat to see kids learn language when they are best um, able to learn it when they're in, you know, early and elementary school. Um, starting language, you know, all the data says starting language at the high school level is really not uh, I, I hate to interrupt you but we have a lot of people that want to again we're like be you know Thanks, be, beyond the time I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna just answer you know this is just like public comments I'm just gonna answer one question a uh, the parameter of six percent from from the board in the past we have done three percent uh, and is, is trying to stay with our with our with our taxes and be responsible in and we Ask them to be creative. Like we said, nothing is set in stone right now, but we are we have to be responsible stewards of the money that the communities give us and use it the best way we can for best outcomes for all our kids. So that was day. So it doesn't in the past we have said three per, we don't always hit that target, but it, we we needed to give them a specific target so we could see what the what the impact it was. It doesn't mean that we are gonna cut a million dollars tonight, right? We wanted to see what that looked like uh, to make sure that we were being responsible. Uh, uh, let me see who's next, um, Kyle. Welcome, Kyle. Hi, Juan. Can you hear me? And we're gonna try to stay with the two minutes. Uh, you're a little muffled, 
in the speaker? Is it just my computer? Is that any better? That's a little better, but still pretty low. And, and get, we're going to try to stay with a minute and a half because there's a lot of people wanting to speak. Can you hear me now? Um, yes, way okay. better. Um, I think clarity is really important and it hasn't been there to date. And, and this budget that's being proposed um, would fire two teachers at Romney, uh, a lunch person, April, who is absolutely beloved at the school, and uh, Senora Donovan, our Spanish teacher, who is absolutely beloved at the school. And the idea that that would happen in a year when the two biggest towns are taking no reductions at all, and so that taxes can go down across the board, that's not going to go over well in Middlesex. I think you'd see a big push to vote down this budget because of those reductions. Um, and it, there needs to be a lot more community outreach because our principal does not speak for the people of Middlesex. But I want to use the rest of my time to read a statement that um, my daughter wrote. We have three kids, two at Romney, and our oldest is a U32, and this is the one at U32 who spent uh, seven years at Romney. She said, Spanish class, as well as the rest of our specials, was one of my favorite parts of being at Romney. Music, art, and Spanish were fun and integral parts of our learning at school. Some other schools that used to have elementary language offered no longer do, and I would be very disappointed to see Romney follow this path by no longer teaching Spanish to kids. I feel the same about cutting or shortening the length of any of the specials. It is very important to preserve the creative spaces and opportunities and learning in schools. Thanks, Kyle. I'm sorry. Maria? Hello. Um, my name is Maria, Maria Malekos. Can you hear yeah. me? I can hear you now. Some I can't you, see you, but I can. I have my video on. Can anybody see me? Yes. Yes. But can you see me now? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Um, my name is Maria Malekos. You um, may remember me as the COVID coordinator for last year. It is very nice to see everyone again. I am currently the school nurse for Callis Elementary, and I am the teacher leader for the school nurses in our district. Um, we came together and put together a letter that I would like to read. <clears throat> I'm going to take a sentence from the National Association of School Nursing and start with a thought that student health care access is a right and not a privilege. This proposal would cut healthcare access in our most rural schools, which historically and currently have the least access to routine medical care. Cutting nursing times in this school is to perpetuate the cycle of poverty in terms of medical and mental health access for these students. Um, there is an error in the original PowerPoint regarding the budget. The statement that the standard for full-time nurses is one nurse per 500 students is antiquated and no longer best practice. This position changed nationally around 2015, and I have attached the current policy statements from the National Association of Nursing, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Association of School Nurses, and the CDC. Um, a lot of the board members have this letter, and if anyone is interested in those links, I'm sure Floor can provide them to you or you can email myself. The current best practice is a full-time school nurse at every school every day. Lots of Vermont districts have not been able to find appropriate staffing to follow this recommendation, but Washington Central has been fortunate enough to hire well-educated and dedicated full-time nurses in every school. It would be a mistake to reverse this practice. According to the CDC position on school nurses, quote, school nurses not only make a big difference for student health and academic achievement, but they save money. Research shows that for every dollar spent on school nurses, society saves $2.20. These savings come from preventing costly emergency room visits and parents missing time at work to care for sick children. Cutting this budget for the short term will not save our school communities money in the long term. School nurses are the only ones that can keep students in school with our clinical assessments. When the nurses are not in the building, 
the medical delegates who are administrative assistants send home every student that comes in with a complaint. Legally, they may not provide any sort of assessment in a school setting. In this current climate, we are seeing high numbers of students out with this triple demic of influenza, RSV, and COVID-19. We have loosened our illness protocols to allow for mild symptoms in school. So without nurses assessing students, we would have many more students missing large amounts of school. Currently, we're seeing about a 20% absentee rate due to this triple demic. Cutting school nurses is a short-sighted solution to a long-term problem. According to the National Institute for Health, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health of children and adolescents is multifaceted and substantial. Survey studies regarding children and adolescent mental health amid COVID-19 indicate that anxiety, depression, loneliness, stress, and tension are the most observed symptoms. School nurses are on the forefront of both physiological and mental health in schools. Students in elementary schools do not have direct access to a counselor. They do, however, have direct access to the nurse, Maria. which makes us the front line. Maria, yes, ma'am. I, I, I hate to cut you. Okay. Could, could you? No, I, yes, I understand yeah. it's a long letter um, I, I, and I appreciate I, your time. Yeah. Um, I will just then say the schools that will face a cut to their school nursing time are our three most rural and underserved. We continue to hear about the work the district is trying to do in equity and removing healthcare access to the communities that need it the most is a direct contradiction to this mission. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mary, and we appreciate what you school nurses do for our district. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try to remind everybody. I, I'm not trying to cut people off. It's, it's really important to hear from you guys. But if you could keep your comments to a minute and a half, two minutes max, it, it would be really appreciated. It, so, it, Rosemary, welcome. Thank you. I'm trying to put on my timer. Um, my name is Rosemary Leach. I live in Worcester. I have lived here for over 20 years. Uh, both my kids went through DOTI and U32. Um, I'm a taxpayer and I worked at Remini for six years as a para and a BI. Um, and I'm still uh, a resident and taxpayer. At this time, I am just a taxpayer. And I'm here to tell you, I would rather pay higher taxes and have none of these cuts. And I think it's really important for you guys to hear that. Um, I'm really just flabbergasted that we're considering cutting nurses and teachers and any staff at these schools working in the schools during the pandemic, which I did, um, every single person was so essential and nothing has changed just because maybe COVID has reduced we still need them all, especially the nurses. I agree with everyone that has spoken today. I can't tell you the service that the nurses give to our students that need it the most, especially the idea that if we're going for equity, uh, we can't cut those nurses. So just to make it clear, I had written a speech, but then because you guys gave us a lot of new information, I just ditched the speech. <laughs> but I want to say that... um. To say again, as a taxpayer, I don't want you to assume that the best thing to do is cut um, taxes. The best thing to do is keep funding our schools and keep our staff um, working at least as much as they are, if not more. Um, and that I won't, I don't want to vote for a budget that's cutting these positions. So that's just something, and I, I'm sure there's other taxpayers that agree with me. Um, also, a couple other things. I, I, I'm glad somebody asked about the 6% because it just seems arbitrary. I'm glad you told us why, but I don't think it's necessary. And lastly, something that gets said a lot at the schools um, is fair is not everyone getting the same thing. It's everyone getting what they need. And it feels like this whole process is just about every school having the same point something something FTE. And uh, so I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you so much. I forgot to say thank you all thank for all the work you do. You are just doing great service. Keep it up, but keep funding. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Rosemary. Josh. 
Hi there. Uh, my name, can you hear me all right? Great, cool. Uh, just before my one minute, my minute and a half starts, I just want to say a little about me. I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom. I did all but one year of my schooling in Vermont. Uh, after that, I, uh, I, I got a tech career, moved to Boston. It was awesome. That was what I was told to do when I went to school. Um, and now I was able to actually buy a home in Vermont, which is where I love to be. And um, I'm going to, with that in mind, just say in response to uh, the Rumney community's understanding of the instruments of the second draft, the proposed 50% or $224,000 savings on the district curriculum services. Based on what I've heard, this results in Spanish being cut completely. My daughter, Addison, she's a kindergartner. She loves Spanish. Studies have shown enhanced, an enhancement of cognitive functions among individuals who learn foreign languages as a child. Learning a foreign language for me helped me learn to code. That was, uh, that was uh, something that it, it dovetailed with STEM. Um, they're, they're cutting one of the two kitchen positions completely. Uh, schools are identified as a key setting to influence children and adolescents' healthy eating. How will we do that with 50% less staff here in Romney? Especially in Vermont, a place known for food culture, how can we, how can we cut out the bottom line like that? Uh, there's going to be reductions to nursing. Bonnie has worked tirelessly to protect our kids from COVID exposure and, and keep the families informed of what's going on in the school during insanity, right? Library. My daughter loves reading. A library is like the highlight of her week. Reducing library hours or availability would be terrible. Music. I grew up in Vermont, like I said, a Vermont-based art education is so special. It was easily the most impactful part of my education. Furthermore, academic outcomes should not be reduced to standardized test scores, as there is more to life than teaching our kids to be economic cogs of production and consumption. If you, would be, if you did so, you would be cutting the joy out of school for a lot of kids, including my own. If the point is to save money, what about COVID money? Cutting positions is not a creative way to save money while also helping our kids. And what is this body's directive if not to creatively solve this exact problem while protecting our kids' educational quality? I cede the remainder of my time. Thank you, Josh. Buenas noches, señorita Donovan. You're next. Gracias. Good evening. My name is Jen Donovan. I'm the Spanish teacher at Romney Memorial School. The World Language Program at Rumney Memorial School has been in the district for over 20 years. In this elementary Spanish program, students are acquiring the language by speaking, listening, reading, and writing. They are communicating in a natural way. They are engaged and inspired to learn. In these classes, students are seen, they are heard, they have a voice, they are special, they are important. This program, is a safe place for students to foster relationships, take risks, and think creatively. By learning another language, students are feeding their brains. They are connecting and comparing to their own native language. They are gaining perspectives. They are practicing cultural empathy. In an elementary world language program, students are becoming global citizens. Cutting this program will directly impact students socially, emotionally, and academically. I know this is a challenging budget. Make decisions that are based on what is best for our students, please. Thank you. This is Jen. Christine. Thank you. Um, my name is Kristen Freeman. I am a Middlesex resident and a parent of a six-year-old in first grade at Rumney and a future Rumney student who's currently two. Um, thank you so much for all the work that has gone into this budget thus far and for the presentation, and thank you for the opportunity to learn more and provide feedback. I understand it's a challenging process, and I want to share concerns about the proposed cuts um, for me, particularly at Rumney. Eliminating world language to me is devastating. My six-year-old treasures her Spanish language class. She needs this in her education. She's okay in math and English, and she's a wonderful child, but she thrives through Spanish, through music. That feeds her creativity and her brain and helps her succeed in school. The Spanish language program contributes so positively to student development and offers er, um, early language learning, which is critical. My six-year-old has an incredible accent. I took six years of Spanish as a teenager and nobody could understand anything I said when I got to Spain. So I am delighted that if she travels and moves beyond Vermont at some point in her life, people might understand her, unlike my experience. 
Additionally, Senora Donovan is so talented, and this is the type of employee we need to honor and retain and keep at our schools. I also want to add that Romney cannot, in my mind, afford cuts to food service. Students need healthy food to have healthy minds and healthy bodies. April is dedicated, caring, hardworking, and talented. I want us to please, please invest in our quality workforce. It's what makes Romney so special. And I'd like to offer some solutions. Does the budget include realistic vacancy savings? I heard the mention that it's hard to staff. I understand that. I know it's a difficult recruitment environment. Are there enough budgeted vacancy savings that could help offset some costs for when positions are expected to be vacant? And if fund balance allows, please consider using fund balance to remove some of these cuts. Please reinstate our valuable and valued services. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Christine. Is let me see. Um, Jay Campbell. I apologize. Could you give me your name again? Jennifer, I should know. Jen. Jennifer. My name's sorry. Yes. Jen. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am currently the art teacher at Rumney School and also at East Montpelier Elementary School. Um, I just want to say the impact of making these proposed cuts is extremely discouraging. We want our schools to attract families. Um, providing these services that we're proposing to cut will absolutely, um, providing a robust, well-rounded education absolutely includes world language, music, healthy meals, nurses, teachers, interventionists, library, um, that will continue to attract um, families to our communities to keep enrollment up and also provide a well-rounded education to these students. Um, I just want to make a statement. I, I'm thinking back to when I recorded this, my kindergartners in art class, totally broke out into speaking, counting in Spanish out of the blue. Um, so it's an impacted, uh, it's impacted them quite a bit. Um, and it's a wonderful program. I've been at Rumney for as long as Senora Donovan and um, she's an amazing teacher as is all the, all the people that are considered um, or you're considering making cuts to. So I'm gonna stop there, but I want our schools to have a really great reputation, have good programming robust programming, well-rounded ro programming, and it includes all the positions um, that are, are on being proposed to um, be cut. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Suzanne? Hi, um, my name is Suzanne. I uh, live in Middlesex. I actually went to Romney myself as a child and I have two children at Romney. I'm also um, a pediatric nurse in the community. Um, I think it is a huge mistake to consider cutting nursing positions. Um, as has been mentioned already, we are in a mental health crisis right now. There it includes depression, anxiety, and eating disorders, which do start in elementary school. Um, we do not have the resources in our community to support these students. So these um, nurses and the schools are vital to keeping these kids healthy and safe. Um, I myself have a child with some anxiety um, and she visits Bonnie every single day. <laughs> um, and if it was not for Bonnie and her support and understanding, my child would be sent home every single day. And there is no reason for her to come home. Um, it's done appropriately and safely. And I really value that relationship that I have with, with Bonnie and the care she gives my children. I also think that in a time when we're trying to teach our children diversity and inclusion, cutting a language that has really been fantastic for both of my kids just seems like the wrong way to go. Um, it also seems counterintuitive to me that we're increasing a health education FTE, but decreasing nursing, um, food services and counselor FTEs, um, when those are all really part of the same package um, and, and are really needed to support our children in schools. Um, it, it just doesn't seem right to me. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I'm just having a hard time keeping track here. Mary Beth? Yes, thanks for the chance to speak. My name is Mary Beth Demansky. I am a Middlesex resident, um, had the privilege of being a teacher at Rumney for over 30 years, 
my own children who are now in their upper 40s um, went to Rumney back in the 80s and 90s. And um, I, again, thank you for all the hard work all of you are doing. I have to say what I just heard about this, reading it on Front Porch Forum yesterday. My first response was astonishment. Um, and I immediately flashed back to 1980 and what it was like to be in a town meeting in, in Middlesex Town Hall and having to convince taxpayers that art, music, foreign language were part of a full education and what we wanted for children. Never in a million years did I believe we'd be back to talking about this. That's one thing I want to say. Secondly, the other thing that really struck me is during these last years of COVID, the heroic efforts of staff, administration, and parents of the population helping to give the kids as good an education as they could. But those kids, this population that has gone through COVID, these school children have already had to settle for less. Despite everybody's best efforts, they have had less than an optimal school experience with remote learning, not being in school, the constant interruptions, and in good conscience, how do we ask this particular population of kids to settle for less again? It just seems completely wrong. Uh, the last thing I wanna say is that literacy is not separate from art. Math is not separate from art and music, library. We have applied mathematics, connect literacy to all these other areas and make them happen. It just, I got to see the fabulous teaching from Jen Donovan, from Jen Campbell. When I was there, it was Lynn Woodard as the, as the librarian. Uh, fabulous teachers. And they, they were the highlight for so many kids at school. And I was always so proud of Romney and often wish my own grandkids who live in other places could have gone to Romney school. Um, with these cuts, I just, I would just feel so heartbroken to see this. And as a taxpayer, I'm happy to spend my taxes to, to not have any of these cuts. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Beth. Ireland, welcome. Hi, um, I'm Arlen Brookley. I am the librarian at East Montpelier and tech integrationist at East Montpelier Elementary School. Um, but my um, question really has to, uh, comes from being a callous voter and taxpayer. Um, just quickly a little context. The education quality standard slide that we were shown um, in the previous budget draft was incorrect for the data that it shared for librarians. Um, for example, it said that my position at East Montpelier Elementary School was a 1.0 uh, FTE uh, librarian. I'm not. Uh, as per decisions made by the school boards in the past when we were in individual schools, my position and the position I know at Callis and I know at Berlin, I'm not clear at Doty and Rumney, but I do know Berlin, Callis, and East Montpelier were all changed to be portioned out between library media and technology integration. These are two different jobs. They require two different endorsements. They require extra money and uh, professional development on the part of your educators to be able to fill those positions. At East Montpelier, for example, I'm a 0.4 librarian to 0.6 tech integration. My question is, if you are reducing the position that it said is 0.6, uh, library for Callis, what's left? Are you removing the tech integration entirely? Will she only be a 0.4 position library? Will there no longer be tech integration at, at Callis? Um, or is it split 0.2 library 0.2? I mean, I just don't know. That's my question as a tax as a taxpayer and parent of a former Callis student. Thank you. And also, I do want to reiterate the thanks. I cannot imagine how hard it is to be in the position of the board. And I know uh, that you have um, brutal work ahead of you. And I do appreciate um, the work that you do and the work of our administrators. I, um, I don't envy you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arlen. It, will you be OK, Arlen? We'll, we'll discuss more in depth when we start our budget discussions. As the board finalize all of the comments from the board and then we'll ask for more uh, for for more information okay but I, I made note of your question so we'll ask that question as board members thank you as long as the question is asked that's fine thank yes. you 
Yeah, I have it right with me. Thank you, Arlen. Uh, good evening, Alice. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Floor. Um, I just want to thank the board, the leadership team, and all of the faculty and staff for across the, the Washington Central School District for all of the work they do for our children. I want to focus on creativity that the board suggested uh, be part of what the leadership team look at. I think that the board, and I'm, and I'm asking you to please um, support that flexibility to be uh, flexible in the amount the board feels needs to be cut from the budget. It is a terribly difficult time. And I know it is very difficult to balance student need with what budget level will be passed by our citizens. I think all of us here will vote for the budget, but I don't think that all of the citizens in our communities will without our active support. So I'm, I'm saying, please, um, let's all be sure we can help the board pass the budget and encourage the board to do uh, as little as possible in the way of cuts because our children need the support. And I absolutely applaud them for starting the planning about structural changes because uh, we really do need to focus on our students and what they need. And never forget that our teachers are where the rubber hits the road. That's all of our, our professional staff. They need our support as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Brian? Uh, hello. Uh, hello, members of the board. Uh, my name is Brian Divelblis, and uh, I'm a teacher at U32, uh, but I'm speaking as a resident of Berlin and a parent of a U32 graduate. I would like to address the business and accounting program at U32. Uh, my daughter attends Castleton University, where she's a double major in sports management and accounting. While applying for internships, she received three opportunities for sports management and marketing, but received well over 100 opportunities in accounting. Her most recent interview was with National Life in Montpelier. I believe the education she received at U32 prepared her for college and that the experience she had with the accounting program influenced the path she has now chosen. You can tell by the opportunities she received for internships that accounting is relevant, but not only is the subject relevant, but, but the way that in which her teacher, Bonnie Gaudapi, presented the program has positively influenced my daughter's choice to pursue accounting as a career. It is my hope that the board will see the relevance of this program and allow our students the opportunity to experience it here at U32. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I appreciate your work. Thank you, Brian. It's good to see you. Shannon? Everyone, I lost my voice teaching this week, so I'm going to do my best. Sorry about that. I'm Shannon Miller. I'm a teacher at Berlin Elementary. I'm also the parent of a child at Berlin and two children at U32. Um, I really am going to take a position that some people haven't, and I'm sorry if it sounds difficult. Uh, Megan, I really appreciate your idea of creativity. I'm interested in it. Uh, I want to hear more about it, and I want to work on it, too, as a member of the teaching staff. Um, I hear everybody who has spoken that all of these positions are incredibly important. All these people are. They shouldn't go anywhere. I hear you. Um, however, it's also a hard math problem to hear that the enrollment keeps on declining and we just want to keep spending the same. It's really hard. And I get that part, too. And I appreciate that the board is taking that on. Um, I feel pulled in a lot of directions. And I'm guessing a lot of other people do, too. I want to teach in a resource school. I want my kids to have amazing programs and teachers, and they have so far. Um, and I also want it to be affordable to live here. I know I can't pay never-ending high, you know, high grades on our taxes, so I think it's just so important to consider it all. Um, one thing I really want to advocate for is just considering student viewpoint on how it feels to be in a very small program or a minuscule grade. Um, sometimes that's not the amazing experience we think it might be. Um, and so I'm really interested in that creativity in just considering 
how can we let all of our students access this? At Berlin, we don't have Spanish. I sure wish we did. That sounds amazing. And everyone in Romney sounds like it's an excellent opportunity for your kids. I wish we could figure out a way to expand that across the district and make it something where multiple schools are being impacted by that one cost. So I just wanted to chime in and say, I really appreciate the creativity part. I hope we can talk about it more and find a way to retain all of these awesome people and opportunities in our district. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon. Uh, Ali? Thanks. Um, I'm Ali Maney. I work at, I'm the librarian at Doty and at Romney. Um, so I'm at Doty two days a week and I'm at Romney three days a week. And it's, um, and I love my job and I love the kids that I work at and I love both schools. And it's really, really hard to work at two schools. And I think it would be important for the board uh, to really listen to the part-time staff and the staff that um, work in multiple schools um, to find out whether these are really sustainable jobs. Um, I'm concerned about um, the decrease in positions and I'm concerned about um, having more part-time positions uh, that are hard to fill with quality people. And I'm very, um, and, and I also just want to um, shout out that the, the librarians um, have been part of our key component to the humanity and justice um, push that we are um, looking into as a district. And I think sometimes it's unclear um, some of what we do. And um, I didn't write a speech, but I just, I, I hope you'll reconsider um, reducing the library position at Calus. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Priscilla, welcome. Thanks. Uh, so I'm speaking as a parent of two kids at U32, uh, as well as a former board member. And uh, just, you know, it, it is, this is a tough balance. Uh, having been on, on the board for a number of years, I know how awful it is to have to cut programs. And, um, but I've also been um, at the town meetings and talked to taxpayers who simply cannot um, pay more taxes. And, and so while as a parent, I'm terribly worried about the kids in our system. Um, I'm also worried about the older members of our community um, who are not you know, they're struggling to be able to live here. Uh, so I want to thank the board for all that you're doing and, and the staff for all that you're doing to try to keep uh, the budget increases manageable. I know that they're very high uh, and, and there are going to be a lot of increases. I know nobody wants to see cuts, uh, but I think we do need to respect uh, our overall property taxes and the impact it has on all of our citizens. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brisa. Uh, Willow, you have your hand up and you're next. And Maya, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you have a comment? Yes. Uh, yes. So go we're ahead. the student reps on the school board, but we just wanted to join the community in speaking about the budget cutting with the positions. Um, when we heard the news today, we spoke with many of the students and we kind of got their feedback on like how this affected them as high schoolers and what they learned in elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just wanted to kind of tell our experience with the programs. Um, music in elementary school for me was really the only reason I continued music in high school. And it helped me improve not only my listening skills, which we all know is incredibly important for an elementary schooler, but also my reading skills, problem solving skills and setting good habits. Um, my music teacher, Miss Dillon, who I'm still like in contact with now and she's an amazing person. She taught me to try new things and fail and try again. And I feel like that's such an important thing for students to be learning through the arts and through music. Um, and we're already drastically losing kids in the music program in 32. And if we don't give them an option and an opportunity to try things like world languages and music, they're never gonna end up trying them. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the Spanish department as well. <laughs> 
So I was strongly influenced by the things we did in Spanish class. One moment that has influenced me to this day was bringing in Planting Hope. By people coming into a state that lacks diversity, it was extremely eye-opening to not myself, but others. I'm so lucky to have had this experience and it has even led me to do a year abroad in Spain. This wouldn't have been a thought without a, the Spanish department or Ms. Donovan as a teacher. By taking away something that is so important to someone that doesn't even know it's important to them yet is crazy. <laughs> There's so much kids don't know about the world and by having a second language, it opens up new cultures and even communication to new people. And we know that the budget, it obviously has to be cut and things have to change, but you mentioned creative pathways for that and just involving the community in those decisions and in that planning, I think is a really good idea. And I think you could get a lot of good ideas from the people here. I mean, there's over a hundred people here and that's crazy. And I think they provide a lot of value. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks for being here. Maybe we'll get to your part in a little bit. Um, next, uh, Sandy, or is it Michael? Who do I? Get? I don't. I don't see you. So, Michael. Oh my goodness! Welcome. <laughs> You're muted. It is Michael, and now I'm unmuted. Um, so I am the uh, parent of two U32 grads from about I don't know 15 years ago or so and Rumney students as well. It's, um, you know, a lot of the discussion has been about saving this position or that position and the individuals who <clears throat> have always given their absolute best for giving our students the best they can. But I wanna go back and I don't remember all the language, but if the concern is about test scores, cutting the positions that you're referring to are probably going to put those scores down for a lot of the reasons that people have been talking about. There's a, there's a need for a well-rounded, creative-inspired education. And if you start pulling the threads and the pieces from that, you're going to wind up having some students who excel and a lot of students who just can't relate to school anymore and certainly wouldn't do well to be studying for these exams. <clears throat> so somewhere in your balance of uh, quality education, creativity, your lenses, something feels like it's out of balance. And I would urge the board to keep that in mind when you're thinking <clears throat> about revising your budget plans. Thank you, Michael. It's good to see you, Patrick. Hi there, thank you. Um, so first, yeah, I appreciate all of the time that uh, the school district administration and the school board has put into this. It is undoubtedly a brutal and tough task. And so I really appreciate it. I also really appreciate the advanced planning on the budget this year has been wonderful and it's hard to engage with, but the community asked for it and the board and district responded and I really appreciate it. Tonight, um, I'm sort of winging it because our whole family has been paying attention to this. Our kids have been listening to their teachers talk, to parents of their friends talk. And it's been a really interesting, our kids who go to Rumney, so it's been a really interesting opportunity to do that in, try to explain what's going on and why <clears throat> their Spanish teacher has to show up and defend her own position. It's, it's just mind boggling. So I agree with almost every single uh, member of the community who's spoken up and I wanna make two points. One, uh, I believe the principal's budget has increased nearly $100,000. I'm not sure why that's happening when all of these teacher positions are being cut. So an explanation explanation to that would be really helpful. In addition, on the subject of property taxes, I'm just a layperson. I'm no educational policy expert, but I believe that good schools uh, bring people to towns. I, I expect that um, good schools lead to higher property values in general. 
So I encourage the board to think about those things and to think about the big picture uh, aspects of this, not just controlling costs in the short term. Uh, in addition, good schools will hopefully uh, lead people to want to move to these to our communities with their kids uh, and reverse this uh, enrollment trend. I know it's bigger than just that, but please take those big picture perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Hannah? Hi there. Um, <clears throat> I'm a parent in Middlesex and I have two kiddos at Rumney and um, I just want to quickly re reiterate, first of all, um, I want to thank the board and thank the um, thank the administration for all their work. And again, I really appreciate the obvious actionable steps that you've taken for reaching out and including the community. And I also really appreciated Flora, your um, your clarity in the introduction to tonight um, and then to um, Megan Roy. Um, setting uh, what the expectations were for tonight, I found um, a lot more clarity than I found, like in, in especially last year um, and the year before. So I really appreciate that. Um, again, I know that um, this is <clears throat> a really challenging time and a challenging task. Um, I want to reiterate a couple points. Um, I, I agree with what Rosemary Leach was saying and also um, Pat Wood. I, um, I think that we really, when we're thinking about long term, we really have to think about, um, I mean, numbers is one of the biggest, I mean, it's one of the biggest issues and challenges in Vermont in general. We need, we need more people. We need a bigger population, obviously affordable housing. Um, and, and housing stock is an enormous part of that, but the schools really are, really are um, a foundational aspect. Um, of what draws people, and I know, and I and I know it's true in the four other towns besides Rumney, and um, Rumney's integrative um, arts and language program was the reason we moved here, um, and so it it really is a magnet. And I just want to say, in terms of equity, like um, uh, Ber they're saying in Berlin, they'd love to have a, a language program, and um, I'd love for every town here. I also want to say that. There have always been differences in the elementary schools, and I don't, I don't, I don't want any. I, I've always heard wonderful things about Dodie's theater program, um, and so, he, and wonderful things about Berlin and music. And there's no part of me that wants those, you know, just because something's not the same at Rumney, I don't want those schools to lose what's special about them either. Um, and just to say, um, I mean, Senora Donovan is just one of the best assets at school. I mean, my daughter for Christmas asked for extra Spanish lessons um, and she's in second grade. So um, yeah, and then the other thing I want you to think about is, is in terms of staffing shortages. So I was a sub at Romney um, during um, some, a couple of the pandemic years. And I will say that um, cutting April, cutting, um, cutting Jen Donovan, they fill so many more roles than just their, just their lessons. So I worry about, I mean, they're essential. They do lunch. I mean, Jen Donovan comes into different classrooms during lunch. Um, and so they have those positions really help spackle, fill holes um, that are a huge challenge. And so I, I want the board and you to be thinking about more than just the, um, more than just losing that instruction, but losing them as, this glue, especially during staffing shortages. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, for members and community, I, I want to thank the community for doing this very hard exercise of taking note of all your questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to email us if you have any other uh, input. Uh, We're going to move now into uh, board operations and discussion so that the the board can discuss uh, the budget and, and ask questions too. Uh, so let's move to 4.1, review and discuss the budget draft uh, on page four. But before we get a, a, you know really started, I, I wanted to let Megan just, it will be great if you could clarify, we took notes of some of the questions, uh, if, you, if we could start there and then, um, and then we'll move on into discussion, okay? Yep, happy to, thanks, thanks Flora. And um, what I'll do is is just clarify a few things that I heard. It's not everything, um, but I think it's important to tip, tee off the board conversation. Um, 
The first one is uh, we we one of the comments was around um, teachers being fired, and one of the challenges of this process is that when we notify potentially impacted staff, we often have to notify more staff in terms of reductions than might uh, ultimately end up um, having a reduction in force notice. Um, and that's just important for the board to know that has to do with seniority and things like that. I am not trying to sugarcoat what the reductions are. Those are what they were in the slide, but I do want to just clarify that's part of why we have such broad conversations. And it's a part of our process that the board put into our timeline deliberately because in past years, um, notification didn't happen soon enough. So that was one piece. Um, a quick clarification on music, and this has to do with um, the person who, who asked, when you look at a reduction, what is it leaving behind? Um, the reduction in music is related to enrollment decline. There is still music in Rumney. Um, and I think that's really important for the board to know. There is not an elimination of music at Rumney. Um, quick clarification on the school nurse position. It has not been decided where that reduction comes from. What this budget proposes is to take the one, the 0.9, actually, it's not even a 1.0, the 0.9 FTE that was funded through ESSER and essentially reduce it a year earlier than the money goes away. And what we would need to do between now and the end of the year is study what the best nursing model is for the district and then decide how that 0.9 would be distributed. So it has not been decided yet where that reduction comes from. Um, I think... Ink. So the one other thing I would I would reiterate, and this is just sort of a reaction to several of the comments of, about this idea of shaving around the edges and reducing the programming, um, and specifically around Spanish. Um, that's why we want the board to to think about this idea of creativity, because if we think about how we are structured, we may get to a point where we say maybe we all agree that access to world language or um, access to a nurse or a counselor all the time, not just on a schedule, is a good thing for all kids. It can't be done in our current structure without really prohibitive costs, but it could be done in a different structure. That's part of why we're sharing this information. And I just want to reiterate that for the board. Um, there are probably other questions. I'm just going to let the board get started on their on their discussion. And if those questions come up, I'll either I will jump in or I'll turn to a principal or a central office person. But I just those were the ones that stuck out for me. Yep. Megan, could we could uh, could you clarify a little bit on the library uh, and tech integrational before we get started? Yep. Thank you. Sorry, I did write that one down. Um, so. One of the challenges with education quality is that it is vague on what how it defines certain things. Uh, I'll give an example. Education quality standards don't tell you how much music, art, um, FTE you should have. They simply just say you need enough FTE to provide music. So with library, they don't distinguish between tech integration and library. They just talk about library and media. So the chart that people are, are concerned about, it is true, many of our librarians by design do both of those jobs. We were simply just trying to create an apples to apples comparison and the apples from the agency of ed and ed quality doesn't distinguish between those two things. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Okay. That was a, a lot to observe for 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 board members. It, we can start questions. I, it's also ten minutes of eight, and I don't want to you know shortchange. I want to have this uh, conversation right now. I just also want to make sure that people don't need to use the bathroom. That they're all good to have the conversations right now. Or do you need five minutes break so that then we can take those three uh, the, the feedback the the um, the review both draft two and draft three and the uh, and the fund balance together at, at once because it's going to take that's going to take us at least 30 minutes what is the measure of the board i would suggest a break five minute break five minute break yeah that's what i was thinking too. okay let's have a five minute break and and we'll be right back so it's 9 51 it's sorry 1951 751 and i'll We'll be back at 57, okay? Bye. Okay, welcome back.
Do I have all the board members? <laughs> At least I see some of you. There you are. Okay. So do you wanna jump right into the numbers? Do you have questions that, do you wanna start with questions? Diane. I would like to start with just a few questions just from clarity. And again, absolutely appreciate Megan, your um, your ability to just re repeat to us and remind us as well as the leadership team and their focus and that. Um, it just, it also, um, you and I had this conversation too about the fact that we can say something and think we have clarity and then actually we were both right but we weren't saying the things that were clear and so language is everything so one of the questions i have is about so we had said six percent and there was a lot of concern about that at the last meeting um but and again i'm not sure what we mean by only six percent because to me it's six percent of a raised tax rate not necessarily six percent of the budget I may be the only one that's thinking that way, but again, that that highlighted to me that. And if I'm reading it correctly, currently with the current information, which we know is you know very tricky, um, but currently all of our tax rates are going down if things stayed constant. Is that correct? Okay. So then, to me, our parameter and and this is clarity I want from the board too. My understanding is the 6% would be on a control of our tax rate increasing, not necessarily of the budget going up. Um, and so, but again, I could be wrong. It could be my thinking. So that that's one thing that I think we need to, when we give that parameter, we need to be very clear on what's the parameter we're agreeing on. Is it 6% of an increase on the budget regardless of tax rate? Or is it a 6%? We don't want to go above a 6% tax rate increase. And then I also have another question, but go ahead, Megan. Oh, well, just sorry. real quick for that one. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, where you go from here is up to you. The original parameter to us was 6% on the expense budget. So that's so that is what that original clarity was. <laughs> to your point, there is new information that is ever changing related to tax increase. It's also why it's hard to give a parameter about tax rates in November because we don't have that information. So you gave us direction around 6% um, on our expenses. What you do from here is up to the board. Okay, thank you. Then the other thing that really it highlighted to me as, as we're having the, these discussions is that we gave a, a, I think we need to be also clear in our parameters around um, where we want leadership team to look at where those expenses are. So right now it looks like it's really primarily direct line. So it's direct line people. And so where does, where do we create this balance of uh, the cuts should be a percentage of direct line? If you, if cuts are needed, um, then they should be a, a percentage that's direct line and a percentage that's that administrative line. If our numbers are really decreasing, are do we have the right balance of administration to, to staff needs? Um, and then also all of those parts around, um, it, it isn't necessarily busing or any of those things, but you know, like even central office, when do we do audits, so to speak, of personnel, uh, <clears throat> And, and it's not evaluation, so I don't want it to be that. But like, when do we take a look at, given the size of our district, given the size of our schools, given the demands on our schools, what is that percentage of direct line people as opposed, and also administrative and, and top tier? So I think we as a board need to think of that parameter as well. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. Any other board questions before we dig into? I want to respond a little bit to that, but uh, okay. Uh, let me see who was first. Chris. Um, okay. Uh, so let me see. My am I okay? I'm, I'm muted. Uh, so this is a question to Megan. Uh, when 
you're using the uh, Vermont Ed Quality Standards. Um, are those uh, objective standards? And depending upon how you use them, does the leadership team use them in a subjective way? Um, well, I'll take a stab. I don't, I'm not sure I'm quite understanding the second half. The first half is those are Vermont, That's it's statutory, it's, or what is statutory is that Vermont will have education quality standards. So those are the measures that, that Vermont has defined at this moment um, is what, rep, what all schools have to have. And, and there is an accountability factor there. We actually get rated on, on how we are. So they are objective in that sense. Now, people could discuss, um, you know, national standards may or may not align with Vermont standards. Uh, Vermont's in the process of changing ed quality standards, which they do periodically. All those things are true. But in terms of what is the kind of law of the land right now, it is them and they are objective. Um, I would say that we are not applying them subjectively. I would say that what we've done as a leadership team is identified the areas in ed quality that right now we are most discrepant. And those areas, one of them is class size. That is the hardest one to achieve without structural change. And what I mean by where we're discrepant, we have far lower class sizes than ed quality would suggest we need. And we believe that, it's, that it impacts the quality of what we provide for kids. There is a point when too small is impacts quality. Yeah. So okay. that's one area. And the second area that we, uh, areas that we opted to look at are those places that we are particularly um, far from ed quality. I think that's an objective way of applying them. So that's what I would say. Because I, I join in, in Diane's uh, observation that the cuts are, are coming from the, the front line workers, you know, with direct, providing direct services to students. Uh, and I'm a little concerned that we're cutting, um, we're proposing to cut uh, staff like nurses at a time when we are still dealing with a pandemic um, and, um, and uh, educational coaches who my understanding is are fairly effective in improving teaching standards, which goes directly to, um, you know, improving student achievement through teacher improvement as well. Um, so was, was any consideration given to reducing administrative staff in this, this go through? Yep, so we looked at it in a couple of different ways. One of them is there are education quality standards about principal ratios. They measure it by how much, how many teachers a principal supervises. We are within education quality standards for that measure. Um, those standards are tricky because they don't give a, um, they give you a bottom, right? They give you the minimum you need. They don't tell you what the maximum should be. Um, and I would say, although I don't have it in my hand to give to you, um, we could provide the board with a um, comparison of our central office FTE compared to similar size districts. I think that could be helpful. Um, our analysis, or I would say my analysis is that we are very thinly staffed at the central office. Um, and in fact, it's, it is, there are, we have individuals in our system working overtime. We have um, things that we know we haven't gotten to right away. So that's my quick response. Um, so the answer is yes, we did look at it. We can provide the board with more information about how central office compares. I think that might be helpful, um, but but that is that is that piece. Okay, um, and I'll, I have more questions, but Floor, I'm going to defer at this time to give anyone else who has their hand up an opportunity. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Michaela? Michaela. Um, sorry. So I think that clarified part of my question, which I was confused by the original explanation about why um, EMES and Berlin were left out. Um, but I understand now it's it's because of that, like there's a too small that then doesn't meet ed quality standards. But I guess my concern is I'm not sure making cuts from the smaller schools is really actually going to result in any improvement in the quality of education in those schools. Um, for, first of all, I guess my question is, does it then bring us into compliance with ed quality within those schools if we do make these changes? And number two, 
um, not actually meaningful in terms of <clears throat> educational quality. Um, and I would be interested to know, um, I, as a Worcester resident and Doty mother, um, what it would look like <laughs> to bring Spanish to, or language to all the schools um, in the district. I know that's working against reductions, um, but I mean, man, people are super convincing how wonderful Spanish is at Rumney. And I think it would be great if we could bring that to all our elementary schools. Um, and lastly, I, I guess I would maybe now or maybe in the future really be interested in um, some of those creative things you talked about, combining pre-Ks across the school, if that really saved money or freed up money and and we could offer full-time pre-K, that would be super interesting to me. So, so thanks. Um. No, thank you. I will just say two quick things. Um, one around the first question about do, do these reductions bring us up to ed quality? I would say across this whole district, even with reductions, we still are um, we are still uh, have far more adults in our system than ed quality would say we need. I'm trying to say that just in a factual way. So, in other words. Um, it makes us closer to ed quality, it does not get us there. And that's just because as a district, we are small. Um, so that's the first question. But what I would say about the second half of your question um, is when we start thinking about things like, do we want our elementary school kids to have access to world language? I actually think that's a great conversation to have. I don't think we can do that on the backs of our current structure. If we thought differently long-term, to me, that is not a quick move, but if we thought differently over time about how we structured our elementary schools to create scale, we could start having great conversations about how do we bring Spanish everywhere instead of how do we shave Spanish from people. So, and you could apply that same logic to Spanish nursing counselors, um, so that's what I would say. I think it actually, for me, that is my response to several of the, the things that you shared. So I would want the board to think about that. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Dania. Daniel. Thanks, yeah. Um, I wanna thank everyone for sort of the, the testimony that, that they've offered tonight really really useful and informative and instructive for us. Um, I also like what McKaylin said. I also think like this thing, idea of thinking creatively about structural changes is something I'm very interested in too. So um, count me in for those conversations as well. Um, I had a couple questions. One, I guess probably was for Suzanne. I was interested in understanding whether uh, the draft two budget expenditures, what, what that represents in relation to um, the excess spending threshold. I understand it's it's suspended as a penalty right now, but, but where would we be in relationship to that? So uh, the AOE provided an excess spending threshold of $22,204. Uh, there are certain things that we could uh, exclude from our per pupil spending, which our per pupil spending comes in at 22,458. So like $200 $250 more than what the AOE excess spending threshold is, but they let you take certain things off of that, uh, including certain debt amounts and capital uh, expenditures and special ed over $65,000. Uh, so we would be below that excess spending threshold were that in place. Thank you. Um, and then I wanted to give Megan the opportunity to respond to a couple questions posed by um, a community member, um, and I realized sort of a discussion of the fund balance is elsewhere on our agenda, but it seems hard to completely separate here. I guess I'm interested in understanding what, where we are in terms of a recommendation from administration on what to do with fund balance, um, whether it provides us with flexibility here, and also the, the issue of vacancy savings came up, and I'm I guess I have my own doubts or reservations about that. I'm curious to know 
whether that's a possibility we can take advantage of without compromising ed quality standards. So, so here's and, what and, I would say. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Laura. Can I just say something? So uh, Daniel, the the budget, the fund balance conversation, that was my, I moved that, you know, it was all the way in the bottom. I moved that. I didn't want us to like just count on the fund balance to have the hard conversations, right? So I wanted to have the, the, the look at the fund balance information after each of you have a chance to say what you absorb from the presentation. And then we're gonna move right into fund balance just with the idea that it, you know the past uh, ways that we have had is to, you know we don't wanna avoid the cliff, right? So we don't wanna get, we probably would have to use some fund balance this year, but that's not what we should be using to have the hard conversations right now, right? So we are gonna talk about fund balance, but we're just gonna talk about them after everybody has the chance to ask the questions and absorb the information without just counting on fund balance. That was okay. a long explanation too. That's I'm okay, okay. with holding back on that one if she wants to do deferring to floor. Okay. Go ahead, Megan. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm totally fine to hold my comment until we talk about fund balance. But maybe on the subject of vacancy savings, is that a possibility, oh. or is that, uh, does that represent a threat? Uh, no, there. Those two conversations are connected because vacancy savings is part of why we have the fund balance that we do. So if we if if we hold to, um, I think Floor's point is well taken because some of our realities are not going to go away, and a fund balance application is a short term solution that may be part of the solution, and it's an important one, but it's not a long term one. So I just kind of in expanding. It's a good conversation to have. Um, yes, it's related to unfilled positions. That's part of how it gets created. We'll come back to it. Thanks. Maggie? I'm on the device where it's easy to unmute. So much easier here. OK. Um, I feel like one of the things that we heard consistently was attracting families to the district. And I'm not sure how we go about this, but I feel like there is this uh, reality that there is no housing. Nobody is moving here because there are nine houses for sale in the entire district currently. And like six of them are under contract and the average price is $450,000. So how do we interface with development review um, and other town committees to have these bigger conversations about how we approach development so that we can actually attract families to move to our district? And if the desire is to keep our small schools um, in their current formation as five elementary and the high middle high school, um, we need to be having those bigger conversations as we're also talking about visioning at the, the educational level. We can't be looking at this in isolation. So I don't know what that looks like. If it's a letter from us as a collective board um, to just put that concern out, um, if it's encouraging people who are families in our educational communities to participate at the local level on those boards, but it, it's, um, I feel like looking at this in isolation and talking about educational quality without looking at the larger climate of housing stability and growth in the community is, um, we're, we're only going to manifest what so many superintendents before Megan have said was going to be the reality. And here we are, it's coming to fruition. Um, we've got it, we have to look at larger scale change than just district educational changes. Um, so that's the, the thing that just like was glaring at me. And I also share McKaylin's um, does, you know, thoughts about hearing the vibrancy of the Spanish program at one elementary school with the awareness that we looked at Callis for years to fill a position and then removed that position when we were still our own school board. Um, so you know what can be done how can we work like at the state level <clears throat> as a district to attract new teachers so that people might be coming in um, for positions like we we have to grow our own um, 
I know those are bigger, bigger things than just talking about this budget, but um, I'm also interested in that visioning piece because we're going to have to make some major changes. Thank you, Maggie. I don't see other board members' hands, but I'm, you know, I, I'm definitely interested in hearing. This is your time to share what you absorb. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna wait. Uh, Kari, go ahead. Or have, we, have we moved beyond uh, clarifying questions? Are we giving our opinions now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, um, so I'll go. I, thank you for the presentation. It was very clear. Um, uh, and I'll say, wow, this is a really difficult one. Um, I didn't disagree with anything I heard tonight, um, and yet uh, changes are coming, right? That that slide about a twenty to twenty five percent reduction in the in the next handful of years, um, cha change is inevitable. Whether it's this year, it's, it we have to we'll be thinking about it every year. Um, I fully support um, exploring the creative measures that were mentioned. Um, and we're going to need to, I suspect we're going to need to explore more measures like that in the future. And so let's get started. Let, let's start looking at it now. And then uh, specifically, I would um, support uh, the board giving direction to, um, in addition to exploring the measures, to, to um, consider a 7% a increase on, on net taxes knowing that the CLA information is coming and that's going to tell a big part of the story. Um, and that was clear in the, in the tax commissioner's letter. Um, we, we just don't know enough. So we're going to, we're going to have to move quickly in, in January after we have that information. Thank you, Kari. Jonas. Thank you, Floor. Uh, so first I want to talk about process. Um, I think it's really, really super important to uh, that people recognize that the board did not ask for service cuts. The board did not ask for rifts. The board asked that the next budget draft be limited to, you know, as we've seen, six a six percent impact, which is, you know, again historically roughly twice as large as normal. Right? I think we needed to see what this looked like, um, and I think Megan's been really clear you know, through the budget process that these are just drafts. These are, these show the impact. Um, so having seen this draft and understanding what that impact would be, there are, you know, there are three, it seems to me there are three sort of roads to go down and those roads intersect and, and intertwine. Number one, start cutting services to limit budget increases. Number two, don't cut services and continue to spend more and more per equalized pupil or three, talk about those structural changes that Megan referred to and that Kari just referred to. And to put that squarely on the table, my understanding, you know, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that those structural changes, you know, when we say that, what we really mean is where our students go to school, right? And whether that's closure or consolidation or reorganization of school populations, it, it Kari's right, it's something we have to grapple with that, that is coming. But that process is going to involve a lot of weighing of priorities and interests and community history and community identity. And it's gonna take a lot of community involvement. And we got a lot of that tonight, which is great to see, particularly after so many of our community forums have been attended by very, very few people. Um, and there was, there was an imbalance tonight, not an inequity, but an imbalance in the community involvement tonight the Romney community has this amazing reputation for being extremely active and engaged, and that was really on display. And um, I wish that, you know, I wish someone loved me like you guys love Romney. Um, it, it's it's incredible. Um, you know, that's and that's been on display a number of times sort of while I've been doing this, but I really want to urge everyone that as we move into these discussions about structure, as we must, that it's going to be super important to think about the district and the district's needs as a whole. Right, as our learning community in aggregate, rather than you know focusing on our hometown schools, you know this stuff about community identity is going to be really, really tricky, really tricky to balance with the realities of declining enrollments and rising budgets. So what now? Um, I think that any responsible process to address the district structure, um, or even you know Maggie's excellent point, right, that we need to address 
these like civilization level issues like housing. Uh, like that process is going to take, I think it ought to take much more time than we have to put this budget together. Um, you know, if we move forward with this budget draft, we're going to negatively impact student learning. We're going to alienate a lot of people. If we go back to something like budget draft one, our per, you know, equalized pupil spending gets even higher, right, and makes the inevitable right sizing of the district to meet the needs of the student population size even more painful. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, to hear, you know, someone, you know, that has, the, you know, the gravitas that Kari Bradley does, you know, say that this is a really tough one, right? That, that, that hits me right, right in the gut, Kari, uh, but, but you're absolutely right. I have, I have no idea what the right thing to do is, but I hope that the community can see that we are trying to do the right thing. Thank you, Jonas. And in case we haven't said it enough, we love you. So, and we appreciate all you do. So, just like the Romney community loves Romney, we love you and the board. So did I say that enough? We love you. Okay. Now I love you, Jonas. There you go. See? Uh, <laughs> Ursula. Did I do that right, Ursula? I'm I was, okay. Okay, I was go gonna ahead. say Jonas just said a lot of things very eloquently that I am gonna just brute force through um, and agree with, but I, this isn't an easy discussion. This isn't something that we're, we're taking lightly. And I wanna take time to thank Megan and the leadership team for the work that they did on it and the community members that came out and shared their passion for our students. I definitely believe we need to look at these creative solutions, which, is where do our students go to school and how do we maximize the benefit to the students? Those smaller class sizes are hard. Um, I guess that's all I'm gonna add. Jonah said so much quite eloquently and I'm not gonna be able to beat that. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, one of the things that I was taken with was the slide of the declining enrollment and people were pointing out that some schools had no cuts and I don't think it's about because I think Megan cleared that up a little bit with a 0.95 doesn't mean a particular person it means across the district as far as that nursing position but um, the declining enrollments are are huge and, and it's very huge in schools and I know sometimes when a school loses 10 kids it's 10 kids across five grades or something. So it doesn't affect that one grade, but it does require the schools get creative with how they use the personnel so that we do have optimal class sizes and we don't, we look at um, the biggest expense in our budget is personnel and it's hard. And as we're talking about the Spanish position, when I was on the East Montpelier board before the consolidation, that's when we had the whole music room filled with parents and floor crying um, because Spanish was important to everybody. And it is, it, I mean, it is an, an amazing program. So when these happen, we get that involvement that is sometimes lacking because it hits everybody so hard and so personally. And I appreciate what the leadership team has brought back to us to consider, to think about. And I also appreciate that it's been shared. This is not final. This is a discussion. This is to help us see what it looks like. So thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Diane? Yeah, what, what happens is we, we get very um, motivated to talk about things when it's at the budget time, and then we get through the budget season, and then we, you know, we bring it, even though we as a board said, yes, we're going to do this earlier, we're going to work on this all year, we inevitably have other things raise up. So, so uh, you know, my inclination or feeling, or I don't know how to make it, is I think we go back to that um, original budget of you know what the draft was that didn't have these same cuts but we know that starting in january the discussions begin around targeted visioning 
And um, Megan, you mentioned that we have somebody who can lead us in discussions, but I think we make a very strong intentionality behind it. And either it's a, a specific topic about our structure and our ability to cover these things or our priorities or our needs, but that we really, we hit it hard immediately and not let it water go under the bridge again. Because yes, it is inevitable. Change is coming. We see those numbers. We know what it is. Um, what happens is because we asked you to go back and do these this 6%, you know, limit it to 6%, that then creates this influx of a lot of um, emotion and people understanding and realizing, you know, you don't realize until it's potentially almost gone. But I mean, my my sense is, you know, I I don't remember what are in the current, if we applied draft one, or if even draft one is what we're saying, we go back to, but if we apply that, what is our, what would our taxes look like with this new information we've gotten? And then, but again, if we do that, it means that we're hitting the ground running and you've already gotten in the sandbox and getting messy around that creative thinking. And I think launching into that sooner rather than later. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, Chris and Daniel, you both were able to ask questions. I'm gonna let Joshua go first and then move into you guys. Joshua. Oh, thank you. Um, First, thanks everybody from Middlesex for showing up. Um, I'm Joshua Sevitz. I'm new to the board. Um, so this is my first budget go around. Uh, please be patient with me. I'll respond to your emails, I promise. I was on the job site today. I was like, oh my gosh, this is serious. I need to respond. Um, so I don't really have anything original to add other than I just want to co-sign uh, what a few people had to say. Kari, uh, I, I totally support the 7%, like looking, like exploring what that looks like. And also, um, I just want to also support what the, the enthusiasm behind Cat Fair and also McKaylin of exploring creativity, like getting excited about our district instead of, you know, looking at the hardships. I mean, there's exciting things to come, I think. And I don't, I think like, yes, it's going to be hard right now while we struggle through this, but um, I think that we are going to come out better for it. Our kids are going to come out better for it. Um, and we just need to all remain engaged and just keep talking about what's important to us, our families and our growth, because there are certain structural changes we can't control, but there's also a lot of really amazing things we can control. And um, I think as long as we look to that and don't get bogged down in sort of the the bad, the hard decisions, I think it'll be great. I think there's good times. So anyway, thank you for everyone for showing up and for all the hard work everyone's put into this. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, Chris, and then Daniel. Thank you, Laura. So <clears throat> you did hear the passion from the Rumney community, um, ranging from Mary Beth Damaski, who's a teacher there probably 10 years ago now, but had a 30 year history, um, and the importance of the Spanish program to the community. Um, each of our small towns um, have similar passions because the school is such an integral party, part of the fabric of the community. It's not like we have a mall or we have a downtown or any other type of central gathering place. The school is basically a very integrative social networking part of each of our towns. Um, and we cannot overlook that because if, this, if schools close, um, then, then that has a, a severe impact on, on the individual towns. Um, I am fully in support of looking for creative solutions. And if Megan could share, because I, I would assume that the leadership team um, also already, at least on the back of the envelope, uh, did a calculation of what the potential creative solution of com 
combining preschools uh, would do in terms of savings, that would be great to hear at the next go round of the, of the budget meeting. In this instance, um, I'm fully supporting what Diana said is that we, I think we go back to the original budget um, draft and let our communities tell us whether they wanna support that type of, of budgeting um, but then also set up a very strict framework and invite our communities in. If we're talking about a creative solution to restructure our school district, we have the community in right away, not at the end. I mean, they learned they were passionate and showed up tonight because they finally got the details on what these budget cuts were going to mean individually. Um, so inviting the community in immediately in our um, creative conversations would be the way to go. But I think we should give the community the opportunity. They can just, they can reject the budget if it's too high. And then we come back and we, we, we already have a draft that we um, have prepared here. So that would be my hope that we would follow that path and, and not let the um, Spanish program, which means so much to the the school and the Middlesex community, um, along with the other cuts there, uh, go away. Because I, I think I only heard the music teacher cut going down as being reflective of declining enrollment. Uh, and Megan, correct me if, uh, if I, I'm misstating that, but that's, that's the cut I heard was reflective, directly tied to uh, declining enrollment. Thank you. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Uh, yeah, so yeah, just in the spirit, if we're, if we're in the offering opinion stage, I think I also like this idea of going back to draft one, seeing what that looks like in terms of an increase in tax rate based on new information. Um, I guess I was curious when Kari made his initial suggestion, I thought I heard um, looking at a 6% tax rate increase or a budget with a 6% tax rate increase. I could have misheard that. I just wanted to give him the 7%, 7%. Uh -huh. Yeah. Not expenditures, tax rate increase or? Yeah, the, the, the same bottom line that we've been looking at, knowing that we don't have the full tax, uh, this tax information from the state. We will know that next time we meet, uh, we'll have the CLA information. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna know a lot more at that point. We obviously will. So Carrie, can I ask a clarifying question to you? Um, so just, what is the current tax rate that we're looking at increase for the first draft budget? Oh, maybe first draft was 9.7. 9.7, 9 9 okay. Well, is that expenditure increase or tax rate increase? Combination of expenditures and, and revenues. Expenditures going no, no, up no, and revenues going down. I think, I think Diane brought up this point before about whether we're talking about wanting to limit it to no more than 7% tax increase on the on our residents or seven percent expenditure sure. increase i believe that the term is local education spending and it's it's what chris what it is it's the portion of the of the tax uh picture that we control all the other components are beyond our control this is the one thing that we have some control over okay and it's thank it, you it, <laughs> got it thanks Ursula? I had some clarifying questions, but Kari cleared up the whole 7%. I would support Kari's suggestion of looking at like the 7%. Um, I think we need to remember that um, we have that duty to our communities to keep it affordable to live here. Um, everybody wants to talk about having this robust program and that's great, but if people can't afford to live here, they're gonna have to leave. If they can't afford their taxes, they leave and they take their students with them, which affects our enrollment. Um, and it makes it harder for new parents and new families to come in. So that's my thought there. Thank you. Uh, Diane, and then Jonas. So, yeah, so I do have a clarifying question. So if we go up 1%, uh, how much of that 1 million cut is it? And then two, I mean, I get that that's what we control, but if we're saying we go up to 7% and it's still no in, I mean, 
as a taxpayer, I expect some kind of an increase. And so to, to be saying I'm cutting personnel and then we end up at, um, you know, a lower, lower percentage, you know, I guess I just, I need to understand what we're saying and that I get what you're saying, Kari, about the explanation, but bottom line, I know I control that, but how much are we willing to say we potentially are giving as a tax rate too? And then also what's the, what, what's the, uh, this amount of money that that one percent will be. Floor, floor, can I respond to that? Yeah, go ahead, Kari. And I think that uh, Suzanne has. The, we had the number for one percent. Suzanne, was it four hundred thousand dollars? Can't remember now if it was more. It, go ahead, Kari. No, I was going to. I think the, the short answer to Diane's question is we don't know. We don't have enough information yet. And we won't until we have that CLA information. I think that it, you know, the what was presented tonight was um, the state tax rate, our local, the you know, the the impact of the local spending, and then last year's CLA. If if last year's CLA holds, we will be in great shape. The tax rates will go down across the board. I think we'll all be comfortable adding back more. Um, so that's why I'm emphasizing that we can't really make many decisions until January and we have that information. But I just think it puts us in a better position to be contemplating more reductions where it's possible for us to reduce be, um, because we can add back comfortable doing that if we have to scramble at the end to, to identify places where, where we think we need to reduce, it'll be harder. Um, but if the CLA information comes in favorable, I'll be the first to propose adding back. Suzanne? 1% uh, is 288,210. Um, one thing that in addition to the CLA is important to think about is that 15,479 is actually set by the legislature after they decide on other things, which means they might decide to use less of the education fund balance. Uh, they might decide to use that to, for instance, pay for universal meals. And that means there's less money to offset those tax rates. So, so even um, if the, the information that we provide the taxpayers says that there's a decrease in taxes, if that dollar amount changes after the legislature sets it, the tax rate still could go up, um, and you are you are considering things. Um, the that ed fund balance when it's depleted, the legislature will have less money to to offset tax rates, and this is statewide, which means in future years you're still going to hit another cliff, and and so thinking ahead uh, in that manner is a really good thing to do. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. And besides, I just wanted to add that besides universal meals, there's a, a, a lot of people who are going to be loving this year to have money for construction aid. We have another high school that has been hit with testing. There's going to be there, there's other needs, so there's no assurance that that money is going to go to decrease taxes. Uh, Jonas, and then Daniel, and then I have a proposal from hearing from all of you and Natasha and Jonathan. I haven't heard from you guys. Um, so what I wanted to say was that I would support going back to the first budget draft. Um, I would ask uh, Megan and the leadership team to to identify any, you know, any <laughs> any budget reductions that they would have enacted in any other year, right? Where this is just money we can, you know, we we don't need to be spending this money. Um, and I would support taking that to the to the to the towns right we heard a lot from romney today we heard a lot from middlesex today like we all know how important spanish is at romney we didn't hear from the other towns as much but i think that those cuts are probably just as important um i i would be okay moving ahead with budget draft number one with whatever minimal you know you know whatever tinkering you can do start that process of you know talking about structure Right, if that's the word we're going to use, structure. Talking about that st structure, starting as soon as possible, um, and 
uh, you know, addressing the budget after that, uh, you know, what, what future budgets look like, because I, I don't think we can do that simultaneously. I think it's pretty clear where the community is. I think it's pretty clear where the board is. Nobody wants to reduce services. Um, we've heard, you know, plenty of people say they'd be willing to pay more taxes. I would be willing to pay more taxes. I for I, I would support going back to uh, draft number one, taking it to the voters and see what they say. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Daniel, and we and then we'll respond. You know, have a couple of Daniel. I was just going to say I don't think I don't think Diane's suggestion and the one that. Um, Jonas just seconded and Kari's suggestion are mutually exclusive. I mean, I think we can look at a 7% increase and what its implications are when we look when we come back to it in January. And we can look at draft number one and hopefully Suzanne can inform draft number one's implications based on new information in January also. And we can look at both options. Um, I also, being like Joshua, a first time, uh, budget experiencer, at least in terms of being in a hot seat, uh, feel really indignant about the fact that the state of Vermont's process uh, puts this much responsibility on school boards to make these decisions and yet doesn't give us the information we need um, to know what we're asking of taxpayers before we ask it of them. And I think a school board or the school board association needs to take the state of Vermont to court um, and tell them to rework their process. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Megan? Yeah, so the only quick comment I wanted to make related to um, the idea of going back to the first draft, we would need some kind of percent parameter from the board because the first draft is actually no longer at 9.7%, right? We had to adjust it. We already know we have increases in special ed, which means it's more than 9.7%. So um, I, I think I know conceptually what you're saying, but we still would need a guardrail because we can't go back to the first draft. It's already changed. So that's all. Uh, I want to give an opportunity to, to Natasha and Jonathan if you have something to say. Otherwise, we'll move right along. And you okay? Did Megan unfreeze? Sorry, what did you say? I, I thought Megan, it, it, for me, she froze up. Is she unfrozen now? Oh, I, I thought she, were you done, Megan, or did I interrupt you? I thought I you were was, done. I was done, and I didn't know that I froze. Uh, okay, uh, maybe it was just my device. Okay. Okay. Um, can Natasha? I, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, listening to public comments tonight was really um, was really emotional for me. <laughs> um, I went to Worcester. I went to U thirty two. I brought my kids back to Vermont very specifically because I wanted them to have the kind of education I had growing up. Um, and so when I listened to the community members who showed up tonight, and thank you to all 100 <laughs> plus people who showed up, um, I feel like they were just speaking directly to my heart um, and to what I really believe in and believe our district is and stands for. Um, and so, I'm like listening to all of this talk about numbers and percentages and I'm, I, and I will be, you know, I'm trying to understand all of that. And I'm also trying to separate that from what, um, I guess from what my heart wants, which is let's find the money to keep the programs in place that allow our students to have the education they've been having. Um, I know that I have a privilege that other people do not have. So I can say, I'm willing to pay more taxes. I know everybody's not in that same position. So I'm not gonna expect other people to feel that way, but I would hate to see us change what we're already offering to our students. Cause I think that, that what we have here is something really special and that's what makes Vermont special. That's what makes our district special. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I that's, that's what I have to say. 
Okay, okay. Jonathan? Yeah, I'll just add a few things too. Um, knowing what we know about the needs of kids now coming out of the pandemic, moving forward, uh, in to my mind, any cuts that relate to counseling, that relate to nursing services, uh, just are, would be a huge mistake. Um, and additionally, I don't think that, I don't view languages, I don't view music or art as in any way extra. I think they are absolutely as integral to a, a curriculum as history or math or literacy. So that, that's, that's what I think. So as I've done historically over many years now on the board and I don't support cuts to to teachers. I'm fully aware of what the what the what as we all are, what the population numbers are showing, the trends. But it, but as I've said many times before, in my mind, if needs of students are going up, even if there's fewer students, we need staff for those kids. So it's not so simple to say because our numbers are going down in terms of population that the needs therefore are also going down. It's just not a one for one comparison in my mind because we know the needs are greater in fact, not lesser. So that's what I have to say, thank you. Okay, so we, we have a long agenda still ahead of us. So I, I wanna try to somehow wrap up this uh, this conversation. And, and I, I have a suggestion. I've, I've heard a lot of you say, let's go back to the first draft. I, I, I wanna speak a little bit about that. I, I think that we would just be delaying the cliff if we just say, you know, if we would be saying, you know, we put these parameters, but really, you know, forget about them. Let's just go back to the first draft. I, I think that, you know, I, I know that we, as, as a board, we want to be brave and accountability doesn't have to be scary. And we're accountable to not just taxpayers, you know, like it was really hard. It was really hard as a Spanish speaker to be put again in the same position that I was when I was in East Montpelier to be speaking not against, but it's just like the, the realities that we face, right? Yeah, of course, we would all love Spanish. I, I want Spanish in every single school. And, and, and I think thinking creatively, we can get there, right? But what are the realities today? So we can do two things. One, we can do uh, increase our parameter from 6% to 7%. And, and that would, you know, like have the options ask. Uh, I think I heard agreement between all board members that the preschool idea is interested, is interesting to the board. That would bring some savings. And, uh, and then um, and, and the, let's see what that does to our to our budget for draft three. I, I don't think that as as a board, it would be best practice for us to just put out a 9.57. And I know that is not that anymore. Back to our border, uh, our voters and expect to be voted down and then come back and do certain cuts. That is not a. That's that's not the way that we've been doing things. It you know it, in in the past we we want to be more systematic. We ask them the I don't know if Megan you could go back to those. It, it was one of the slides that show what was in the budget it, from those parameters. The education. Um, um, I'm trying to think about the. The, the slide, but like we, the multi-layer system of supports is still in, which means that the coach, uh, our coaching program should be in good shape because multi-layer system supports does, in, does not exist without coaches, right? Is that, is that a wrong statement or is that it's like? Well, what I would say, I think this is the slide you meant. Yes, yes. Um, one, one of the things that I would say is when we looked at reductions to get to the board parameter and show you all what it looked like, um, there was also a recognition that, that um, if we had to make difficult choices, we would want to do that and keep people in front of students and hence the reduction in coaching. Um, I would say that that's, a, a, and I'm going a little bit not having gone back to the leadership team on this, but I would say that, that being able to come back to the board with a, a revised presentation 
with a new parameter would allow us to have that conversation. Is yeah. that a good idea to, to continue with a coaching reduction? Um, because that idea that coaching is part of how we make sure first instruction is what it should be. Um, I think folks on the leadership team would agree with that. So I hope that doesn't feel like a non-answer. I think what I'm saying is um, the leadership team would appreciate an ability to say, okay, with this new parameter, this is what our recommendation would be. Okay. So that we could have that conversation. And and that's what like I we you know we meant that parameter right so like if the multi layer system supports and first instruction needs the coaching and and we're giving you a little more wiggle room please you know take that uh, seriously from all of us Diane. But if we read back our notes, you know the the minutes that were kept at the last meeting, there were several who were listing concerns over that 6% parameter. And so I still have some pretty strong concern over what we're, we're saying around those parameters. We were, you know, and we were assured this was being brought to us so that we would know what that looks like. And that, um, and so, uh, Flora, you're mentioning around the coaching, but we also heard a lot about nursing and again, that might be spread out. We don't know what that looks like because it's a structural change. So I guess my concern is if we're still, and and I completely get the reality of we don't know until, and we, you know, we'll be probably lucky if it's early January that we know about CLAs. Um, but, you know, we're, our hands are tied by that. But I guess I'm, to me, I'm not willy nilly approaching the fact that we gave this parameter and now we're not uh, here adhering to that parameter. Um, I think the stark reality of what that parameter is going to potentially do when we haven't had completely the chance to have the structural conversation and creativity beyond about a month um, is what's worrisome to me. It's not that I'm saying I've got my head in the sand and I'm, I'm denying it. It's just that we need a lot of of work toward that and a lot of firmer knowledge um, before we just say we're sticking to either a six or even seven percent parameter because who's making the decision then about which parts are still in that budget or not so what, what i would say to that diane is like if we give them some guidance seven percent we do not make you know we we hire them to be the instructional leaders you know like they would figure out what is the best way to use that money to for best outcomes for kids and when i mean outcomes i'm not talking about test scores that was a word that was used a lot we i, I don't i don't think that you know it, either jen or megan in their curriculum instruction where we look uh, or when we sit as at quality, we're not looking at test scores, right? We're, we're looking at test scores, but that is not the focus of what is best for kids. So, so if we at least are able to agree on a seven percent for now, see see what that does for for the budget, and they come back to us with the numbers, and then we are engaged. As you all know, we put a request for proposals out for for hiring a. If a firm to do our strategic planning community engagement, their number one goal we have, and gives us it part of this year and part of next year to really meaningfully engage the community so that we can be more creative and have more creative solutions that include structural changes. You know, so we're not, you know, like we all say right now, we're not talking about closing schools right now. But there is a potential in the future to change. It doesn't mean that we're going to change schools, but doing things uh, differently. And it'll allow us that time to, to do that. For now, we let's see what being creative with the preschool, putting that 7% it does for, for, the, for the numbers. And we have the meeting in January. It, we will have a meeting as a finance committee. I don't have it right in front of us as the, the planning uh, right now. And if necessary, we, we have an additional meeting so that we can consult again with the, with the, with the public and the board before we make any final decision for, for the budget. Yes or no. <laughs> Or maybe, you know, it's not like a, I, I'm not looking for a motion. I'm just looking for a guide, you know, to give some concrete guidance to. So can, to can I ask Megan a question? 
Megan, what is the sense as to what the percentage increase is on that first draft now that we have additional information on the uh, special ed? If you, if you have a sense of it. I'm gonna ping that to Suzanne who's shaking her head, which means we would probably need to calculate that before we'd be able to answer it. Okay. Yeah. What I, was looking, what I was looking for for there is that that would give us the number that the first draft budget would truly be in terms, terms of an increase and then compare that to where we are now and, and get a sense as to, I mean, cause we're still talking about significant cuts here um, in very select areas like first line direct instruction uh, in nursing and counseling areas. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't, it didn't seem like it was something that was across all, the entire budget for things like extracurricular activities um, or things like that. I don't see anything that was referenced there. So, um, and the, the direct line, cutting the direct line uh, instruction is, is problematic for me. Um, so I'd like to see where we can come more than 7%, because I don't think 7% is going to do much. Susan, Susan said it's, what, $240,000? I'm just not saying that's not a little bit of money, but compared to what we're looking at in terms of a million, it's, it's 25% more than, so it'd be a 25% reduction of the reductions that we already have. So I'd, I'd like to see that other number and, and come, come closer to a middle number between the six and whatever the higher number is in terms of a, a goal. Um, can I, I'm, yeah, I might be the only one who's confused here, but I thought that this current budget that you presented came in at 7.5 something percent. Is that so? So if we say seven, then we're actually asking for further reductions from this one, correct? Or am I? Yes. So I'm not personally okay with that. I, I, um, <laughs> I don't think we should make more cuts or more reductions um, unless we find a super creative way. It doesn't mean cutting programs or positions. Um, I would say, you know, why not try to stay within the state average, which sounds like is 8.5. That would be my, my vote. <laughs> Suzanne, and then Ursula. Uh, I feel like the 8.5% um, people have kind of clung on to it because that was in the tax commissioner's letter. That was an average of every school district in the state that reported based on their first drafts. And many of them are in the same position that we're in where we're going back to the, the drawing board and saying e, eight and a half is too much. And already we've seen uh, districts around us backing down to 6% and other ranges. So I, I don't wanna hang our hats on eight and a half as what the average will end up being. All right, well, thank you for that clarification. I guess that, that my sentiment still stands, which is I'm not really okay with requesting further reductions from this current draft. I would say, fine, make, make it 8% or make it the 7.59%. <laughs> well, yeah, let's, let's have Ursula and Joshua, and then let's move into the fund balance because I think it would help inform this conversation too. And and when I'm when I think about the seven going to seven percent, I without knowing the number of what the preschool savings could potentially be and being more creative, that's where I'm seeing that maybe it was that half percent. So I'm not asking for further reductions. I'm just saying, you know, go ahead and look at what preschool could look. And maybe that brings us down to seven, just so that we are coming in within, you know, others. Hey, Ursula? I had a question. Um, maybe Megan can answer it. I know we just talked, Floor, you proposed looking at just flexibility within the preschool, the creativity with the preschool program. Are there other places that we can be creative in this budget that <laughs> might help us further? That, Some that are the realistically? Yep, some of the other um, creative solutions that were brainstormed only far enough to give the board a sense um, would be combining other grade levels, um, not just pre-K. So one could be moving a very small kindergarten class over to another school, um, same thing with a sixth grade class. That would be the next um, 
creative step that doesn't require full scale restructuring. Um, we could put some more detail around that for the board if if the board wanted it. Um, I would like to see um, in the next draft, like not just the preschool, but what would we see with those other creative moves that aren't full restructuring that that would be realistic for next year or you know in this budget but would that include staff reductions is that where the savings is coming from okay that's critical for us to know it would in both and just a reminder that you know 80 percent if not more is the only it's staff right so mm -hmm. <laughs> there's very little other places where we can so let's say uh, Suzanne can you or Meg I don't know who wants to take the fund balance conversation uh, reality check for us I will gladly turn that to Suzanne <laughs> uh I'm happy to lead that discussion um in your report I think it's one page 140 uh, 144 and 145 uh, are the fund balance. Uh, current projections for end of year fund balance are at $1,563,262. Uh, in the past, the board has used a target of 2%, which would be 2% of our current year budget, and that's $723,385. So Above and beyond that 2% is 839,877 dollars. That's based on a projection and a, a significant portion of that fund balance is derived from unfilled positions. Um, and so we know that that does put a strain on uh, the humans in the building, um, buildings, multiple buildings. One of the things that uh, has has arisen is what is what is that two percent or why are we picking that two percent and so i've reached out to our accountants we have not been able to connect and unfortunately i can't connect with them until tomorrow which is a timing issue um but some early indications from them are that we have this unique ability because of uh the vote that the district does at town meeting that allows the school board to decide what to do with the fund balance normally school districts are required to put that money to offset the tax rate so that one million five hundred and sixty three thousand dollars we would be required to reduce the tax rate using that as a revenue but because you have that uh article that the district votes on um you you as a board have the ability to decide what to do with it and in the past you've made decisions to move it over to capital and sometimes just to hold uh, that two percent and and a little bit more i know some some people have a, a comfort level that is higher than two percent they'd rather keep keep money on hand um some of my early conversations with the accountants uh include designating specific things to hold that money for so um what you've done in the past uh indicating that you want it to offset the equity scholar and residents or you want it to offset early retirement programs or adding teachers at certain schools that's exactly what um the accountants indicate they they would like to see you do with the entire fund balance have a certain indication that you want to set aside three hundred thousand dollars for equipment purchases and um you know certain amounts for different categories so there's bigger deeper conversations that happen you absolutely can use uh, a certain amount to offset the tax rate but that is your uh ability to decide as a board Okay, questions from board members. So one, you know, eh, just to not get ahead of you guys. So thinking cre creatively with the fund balance, but um, eh, let's let's discuss it before I put my Daniel. Yeah, I have two questions uh, for Suzanne. One is, you're talking about savings, vacancy savings. Are these vacancy savings that are re being realized this year through vacant positions, or you're projecting vacancies next year as well? And in, in expecting savings from that, I'm not. Uh, this fund balance has nothing to do with next year. It's current year only, and it's uh, vacancies to this point in time. With the assumption that we would fill these vacancies 
next week. Okay, thank you. And the other question was, uh, how would allocating the full, just hypothetically, the full 839,877 excess um, towards um, budget spending affect our capital plan? Would it? None of this money is currently in the, the capital plan. The capital fund is a separate fund from this amount. So you've already deferred a certain amount to plan for your capital improvement plan implementation. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't affect it. And the amount deferred is adequate? At this point in time, I would say it is. Um, we are coming back to the board. I think it's scheduled for March um, to discuss the FY26, FY26 uh, year of that plan. So the next year to add on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ursula. So Susan, my question was, cause you're talking some of the advice is that the entire fund balance gets allocated, right? Like by other places, do they have sort of like, I'll call it a fund for capital fund overtures. So like if we, if we allocated the full 839, 877 and we had capital projects that ran over because cost increases where do we find that money so Sam, um the so exactly <laughs> like yeah. that's that what what we're talking about there is your comfort level so the board has to decide as a unit what the comfort level is. And so maybe that's putting money into different buckets. And that's why I wanna have that fully fleshed out conversation with our accountants is what they've seen in other districts and what best practice might be. Um, we, we just have that really unique ability that the board can decide this and, and it doesn't automatically have to go back. Thank you, Sam. Kari? Um, I, I think I support what Suzanne is describing. I, I would caution us about using the fund balance for normal operations, uh, because unless something changes in the future, then we would have to come up with that amount of money plus the future increases um, in, in future years. And in my experience, we've, we've done that before, and it's extremely painful the following years. So um, it's sort of like the ESSER funds. Uh, we should be thinking about it as one-time sources and they should be matched with one-time uses. And so what are those things? You know, it, it would often be something, a capital expenditure that's an, above and beyond our normal spending. And if we can't identify any of those in the coming years, then we should develop a plan to sort of rationally draw that down um any any amount that we don't need but let's do it in a way that's thoughtful and doesn't cause us pain down the road daniel i just wanted to really quickly add for the public's benefit the reason the members of the finance committee have all asked these questions is because we've been looking at bids coming in 80 90 100 percent over our estimates and it's alarming and those projects often can't be delayed. And so we need to understand sort of what the risks we're taking are uh, when we do away with excess fund balance. I'll agree to that and also add that as a, as a district, we do not have enough money to take to properly take care of all our buildings. We each uh, you know, we have enough money to take care of the projects that we have right now, but we haven't put enough money aside for the value of each building as it is right now. So, um, do we do we have agreement? Is there is this a year when we want to make an exception for a certain amount of money? Last year we did, it, or two years ago we did. A, no, it was last year. Yeah, we did a, um, a, our we did Shelley, 
this year, you know, we, we could say, you know, like, let's take it, you know, for this one time money, the ESSER funds are going away for, for the nurse. That could be one option just for, for this year while we figure out how best to do nursing, like Megan mentioned, in that uh, across our district, if that's something that we can buy in for now, but just that one specific and then keep the money for, from what I hear from other finance but uh, committee members is keep the money in case we need it because we're seeing projects come in really high and the built environment affects the outcomes of our kids as much and our staff too. Diane? So I, I don't know where we're landing as to what what draft we're going to get back, what what the draft is going to look like. But my sense is, you know, not nest. I guess depending on the information, what we land on there. If if it doesn't look like we're really making as many cuts or cuts at all or whatever, that we make the decision as part of that package. That um, you know, because I don't know what I would be agreeing to right now in terms of of amount at all. So it seems to me that it becomes part of part of the package depending upon um what it looks like once we know once we have more information i guess i'm i'm um i'm not opposed to potentially dipping into the fund balance but i don't know what amount that would be right now and i don't know what that need would be right now so i guess to say an amount tonight i just don't know that i would know that Ursula? I would be interested in seeing the numbers for what it would like what it would cost to the capital fund or the general fund balance for covering the nurses. But I think we need to look at the harsh reality that things are changing and we can't keep pushing off the changes that we need to make or they are going to be even more painful when we do have to make them, when we can't push them off any longer. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I think that we have come an agreement that we don't wanna use fund balance to offset our taxes, right? That if we need to dip in just a little bit, maybe for the for the nurses, see what they come back to us, and then if we, it seems to me that we might need that extra meeting for 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 the community and and for us, and maybe because we have to wait for numbers to come out, maybe we talk about a meeting a, a January eleventh, or we we can you know send something to you guys. But it looks like we might need an extra meeting. Is that I don't know if it's realistic to try to find the time, but it looks like we're going to need it. So now that we've completely confused Suzanne, I, I don't know, Suzanne and Megan, we've been extremely confusing in some ways and in some others trying to be really clear. So I think there's appreciation for all the work. Uh, we want to be creative. Uh, let's see what 7% uh, looks like. It dip into the fund balance just a teeny bit to see if you need it for for the nurses, but don't count on the fund balance to offset our taxes. And I know, Diana, I'm looking at you and I'm looking at some others. I know that some, you know, that we're really concerned about it, losing staff. The realities are, 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 are harsh. Let's see what 7% looks for right now or, or 7.5 where we, where we are, if it doesn't, um, Diane. I mean, I'm you're, I'm giving that look because it seems to me yeah. several of us have said repeatedly 7%. And then when McKaylin pointed out that that's actually lower than what we're looking at right now, I, I guess I'm just concerned. I mean, if, if you want to put it to a vote, I'll vote no, and that's fine. And then, you know, the, the majority can do with what they're going to do. But I, I don't know. I'm just very concerned at putting forward and I am again I'm not putting my head in the sand and not in denying the need for change and for structure I'm just saying that right now we're making what I feel are some austere moves before we have the full information and to again say seven percent when we're already at 7.5 I'm just very confused by that
I'm with Diane. We, we, we have to come in above this, above this draft. I agree. Right. I mean, there's, we're, we're hearing from the community. Like it's very, very clear what the vocal members of the community want, right? There are lots of members of the community who are not here. Um, but I would, I would prefer to err on the side of a higher number and have the community vote it down than come in with a lower number and alienate the community. So it, I'm trying to process this. So when I, when I say 7%, I like, like I said before, I was counting on the preschool stuff to bring it down to 7% or leaving at 7.5. I, I understand we, we, had a, uh, we, we had a lot of community members show up today and I'm sure we're gonna hear more from them and we're gonna take a, a, um, we're, we're gonna take even more information. It, it, let's give, let's look at both, look at 7% and look at what, it, where we were before at nine. Point seven was that we were Megan, so so that we're showing we're showing what that tax rate looks for 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 both and uh, I'm getting confused my on my own self uh, here, but uh, I, I'm here from I, I hear you you know Jonathan that you know there's some hard decisions that we're going to have to make. Let's see what nine percent nine point seven percent looks, which is what we had before. See what that looks with the tax uh, with with the tax number and where we land if we are above our twenty two uh, if we're above uh, twenty two thousand two hundred and four from the from the threshold, how high much higher up of that we are with with that. I know Suzanne said we are right now at 22,458, uh, 22, we can offset that by some, uh, by, by some amount. Uh, but I'm not, uh, I don't think that um, we're comfortable going too high up from that threshold. Lindy? I'm in trouble finding my mute. I'm the only thing, well, it's not the only thing I'm confused by, but um, you keep mentioning the pre-K. I didn't think that was like right now we were planning to have that under control for next fall, that we were possibly consolidating some pre-K. Am I wrong? I, I think we're saying to them, what would that look like? Me Megan? <coughs> um, yeah, I would agree. I, in our look at creative solutions that don't involve large scale structural changes, combining pre-K was something that felt like it was worth investigating because it could actually improve access. Um, and so it would realize reductions, improve access, and it would not be like a um, whole scale restructuring without the community engagement. So that that's what I am hearing in terms of why pre-K. It's also why I led with that one. If we're going to get permission to do creative things um, and again, it wouldn't be a decision. It would be showing you more detail about what it would look like. So show us what 9.7% is and show us what 7% is, including preschool. Is the, would that satisfy the board? And then we make a decision. Uh, oh, Daniel, I see your hand is up, sorry. Well, I was just gonna, just to that point, 9.7, we're not sure it's 9.7, right? With the special ed funding changes, it might be slightly different. Well, I think what I'm hearing is let it be 9.7, recognize that it will still require a reduction because it went up a little, but at least it gives us it gives us an upper bumper that is closer to what your original upper bumper was. So it would require some reductions, but not to the extent that we had. So that's how I was hearing the 9.7. <clears throat> and Megan, thank you for that. I think that's a good clarification. Thanks. I like this plan floor. I think, yeah, for me, just the 7% does not compute anymore in light of new information. I mean, I think the reality is, you know, we have a situation with significant inflation. We also have this $65 million education fund surplus sitting there. And, and the 7% budget, at least with the best information now, results in a, in a net 
um, tax decrease, which just doesn't compute when you look at the pain that we are asking the district to absorb. So I, I'm much happier with looking at the 9.7 level again in that series. Thanks, Daniel. So board okay with that? We'll look at both. Yes. And we'll make a decision at the meeting. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So can, can, can I say something? I am. Um, Thank you. I have, I have to leave because yeah. I have to go pick up my kids in Lebanon. They took the bus up from Boston. So I have to oh, okay. leave, unfortunately. Um, and I'm ask Natasha. Yeah. Is Natasha, Natasha? Can we, Chris, I have a suggestion because we're so, uh, you know, we, we, we've right. taken a lot more time. Can we, can we just do 7.1 in the policy? So we'll hold the rest of the policy and just do the mascots and school branding today? Sure. Is that okay with the board? Yeah, okay. So I, I'm not saying that you have to say um, it's okay, Natasha can no, do no, no, it, no, no. but I'm just saying if that's comfortable with you, we would just do that. And then I know our students are still with us. Because yes, we, we still have there. other business. Still we might okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, we still have another little business to go uh, I, I, in uh, in board operations, Chris. So I don't want to like shift completely right now before you go, okay. but I just wanted to make sure that before you go, if that's okay with you, can we do that? Absolutely, can do that. Um, okay. And if you, if you want to also like address 7.3, the primary clarification I would point out to the board is that we kind of shifted if you don't, if you want to, but, but let's, just, let's, let's just stay with 7.1 for right now. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Right. See Bye. you later. Good luck. Thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, four point uh, education quality priorities. Sorry, students. I'm not, I know you've been so good. We're almost there. Almost there. This is going to be super quick. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, Kari, it's going to be quick. All right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest we uh, table the conversation. And on page 18, there's a summary of the key themes that we took from the conversations that we had as a board and committee about uh, about the monitoring report we received in November. So we we wanted to take a, the opportunity to check in, see if we're on the right track to be capture everything. If you have additional thoughts, please email me or somebody else from the Ed Quality Committee. We'll have time to talk about this in the future, but I think we need to move on. Thank you. All right, uh, mail-in ballots. Uh, we I want to thank the board members that attended the the meetings. And if I could have a motion, I can read it. If you don't have it out, I move that in accordance with the votes of the five town select boards, ballots for the WCUUSD annual meeting be mailed to all active, not challenged voters in the school district. Second. Jonas, I have a second. Uh, uh, Lindy, was that you? I think Daniel got it first. Okay, Daniel. Okay, Jonas and Daniel seconds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none. Thank you, everybody. The motion carries. Uh, staff appreciation. Diane. Uh, I think we've done a lot of appreciation through the meeting. Are you comfortable with that? And in order to, to, we love you, staff, <laughs> you know that. Let's move into student reports. Hi guys, thank you. Okay, so the student council had a TA representative meeting. So all these TAs had someone that they chose from their group and brought them to their meeting and they just talked about issues that are going on in the school um it was really interesting Maya and I went and we just sat and watched and listened to what students had to say and overall it was pretty successful and in the future the student council is interested in trying to work closer with the school board and with us to connect the two yes um also earlier this month we had the middle school theater performance 
in which we sold out and had to turn a bunch of people which, away, which was a huge success. Um, and then we have our high school performance coming up again soon in March, I think. Um, we also are planning a teacher or staff in service for the district um, on January 17th. Run, part of it will be run by SSJ and we will be presenting on um, queer issues and questions that were commonly asked by teachers and just trying to educate the whole district about that. So that's a big project that's coming up for us as well. Um, word of mouth is starting up again. So that's gonna actually happen when we get back. So that is a student led kind of talent show, but it's very low key and it's during, I think, callback. So kids, it used to happen when my oldest sibling was there and she would perform, people sing, people dance, they do whatever. So it's exciting that the music is coming back into U32. And finally, uh, we're getting into college acceptance season. So we've already had a lot of seniors get accepted and um, that's super exciting. UVM came out yesterday at five. And so a lot of people found out if they got in. And that's all we have that's for all today. We, have. <laughs> we will probably be heading out now. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Please, safe Wonderful. travels. Thank you for Thank staying you. with us. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. You got to hang out with your principal. Pretty cool. All right. <laughs> Good. Okay. I'm busy myself. So Superintendent Central Office report a you know, I, I really want to make do justice to this report because there was a lot of information there, and especially the class size recommendation. You know, we ask you for all this work. And I know it's late. If the board members have questions or want Megan to just do a quick, if there's a couple of things that you would like to highlight, how would you like to proceed? I, I, I mean, if it, it... I, in normal times, would have given Suzanne a chance to kind of acknowledge the comings and goings of folks at central office. Um, so I'll leave it there. And the class size piece, I mean, I think um, I'll respond to questions because I, that is so related to the conversation we just had that um, I could reiterate it, but I think you you get the spirit of it. If anyone has questions, though, I'm happy to answer them. You're good. Clear. Okay. But could could I'm sorry, could we have Su Suzanne talk a, a little bit about the comings and goings? There is an important going. Uh yeah, sure. Um we had good news and bad news. And the good news is that we hired a new accounts payable accountant. His name is Tom Hamlin. He came on through uh, the temp agency and was a fantastic fit and we brought him in on a permanent basis and we're really excited that he's uh, joined the team um, but unfortunately Virginia Breer our senior payroll and cash accountant uh, gave her notice and has a really great fantastic opportunity uh, to be an assistant finance director for Washington Electric Company uh, and so we're in search of a new uh, payroll and benefits specialist to fill her shoes. And um, we wish her all the best. She's been a fantastic uh, employee for the district and devoted and committed to uh, making sure everyone gets paid. And uh, Penny and I have been doing a lot of training in the last couple of weeks and finding out exactly what that takes. So it's um, big shoes to fill. Thank she's you. been there a long time. She's been there a long time and her and her she's a avid photographer and her pictures will continue to decorate our central office. So we'll remember her <laughs> and we wish her well. She was great. Um let's and thank you, Floor, for um being very quick to respond and to share appreciation at her at her party. I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, and I got to meet our new employee and he was great too. It was really funny. Uh, okay, uh, principal's report, page 24. 
do you guys have any questions uh, for our principal before guys and girls are still here? Okay, don't I know we've put you to sleep tonight. There's I guess I just want to say thank you. I know this is a lot. Uh, it's it's a lot of work for principals to put all this information. is 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 really clear. is is great. It really keeps us a sense of what's going on in our schools and and really informs. You know, uh, we're better informed as 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 board members. So so thank you. I don't see anybody raising their hands for for questions. No. Okay. I, Okay, thank you again. Uh, Report Center of Vermont Career Center. Uh, we're just gonna uh, table that for right now. We are doing the same thing. We're going through the budget process and and we'll continue to work on that. Let's move into our audit report because we have an action. Uh, page 30. Do I have a motion? I move to accept the audited financial statements for the Washington Central Unified Union School District for the year ended June 30th, 2022 from RHR Smith and Company. Thank you, Jonas and <clears throat> Ursula. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ursula has it. Uh, all those in favor? Well, there, was there any discussion, any questions from board members? I know the finance committee got to see it. So uh, before any questions? Seeing, oh, Diane. Can we just tag on with appreciation that we accept yeah. it with appreciation? Thank you. Jonathan Ursula, okay, with the friendly amendment. I don't okay. really know anything about RHR Smith, but if they have your blessing, Diane, they have mine. Well, no, I, I meant, yeah, you're right. Uh, the staff, with appreciation to the staff <laughs> for the hard work. <laughs> just Jonas, <laughs> comedian. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Policy committee. Natasha, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Uh, let's have a motion first. Is that okay? And then if there's any discussion, you can answer. So could I have a motion? For the second this, reading, move to approve the second reading of policy F2. Yes, please. I move that we accept the second reading of policy F2. Could I have a second? Second. I got it. Yes, Lindy, you got it. <laughs> All right, second by Lindy. And Lisa, I haven't been checking with you, but I assume that we haven't put you to sleep and you're still with us. Um, and you got so, it. Yes, I'm here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hey, all those in any questions? Okay, thank you, policy committee. Hey, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. And we, you know, we are tabling the other 7.2 to 7.5 uh, for today. Then we have the consent agenda and we had several minutes and I'm wondering if somebody would be willing to make a motion for the minutes. I then... move to accept the minutes of November 16th, December 1st and December 7th, uh, 2022 with appreciation for Lisa Grace. Thank Second. you. Thank you, Ursula. And we all second that appreciation for Lisa thank you for all you do all year and thank you for the cookies that you gave us the other day uh, all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, Four. aye. 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 I think yeah, my name was missing from one of those from the minutes from the community forum at, at Callis okay Lisa, did you get that Got got it. Do you do you know which date it is offhand? Sorry. That, that was the seventh. That was the seventh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll change that. Sorry, Natasha. That's okay. Thank you. Now I'll say aye. Okay. Good. 
You know, by saying I was all, you know, with the small amendment, please say aye in case I made that more confusing. Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. Lindy, board orders. I make a motion to accept the board orders of 12 21 22 in the total amount of $1,820,676.41. Sorry, can you say it again? I'm getting tired. 1,820,000 and then what? 676.41. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A second? Second. Thank you, Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Oh, Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Okay. All right, moving into personnel. 9.1. I move that we accept the uh, extended leave of absence request for Daisy Scarzello, U32, uh, middle school science teacher. Okay. Floor, do we have a second? Kari, you... Yeah, but let's separate them. So it's okay. We'll do it individually. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Okay, and now the second. Because there's a second one, sorry. I don't have that. If someone else has that, I must have the old packet that doesn't have that. You're correct, Jonas. This one was sent uh, Monday, if not. Monday. It was email. Out. Yeah. Can uh, Lindy, do you have it right there? I'm looking for it. Did it come from Melissa? It yes, came from, it, it came from Melissa. Yeah, I got it. It's um, um, so it's a request to thanks. for a 0.25 FTE unpaid leave of absence for Kate McCann for. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, for base what well let me no. she's in the legislature <laughs> right yeah i just i was um january 4th through the end of the legislative session <clears throat> could i have a second and then we'll can have a little discussion Ew. i'll second it lindy so lindy and diane and then if Stephen or Megan, not to put you guys in the hot seat, could we just talk a little bit about what what this is? Sure. I and um, maybe just we'll start with um, Stephen can kind of give the detail about what that means. 0.25 leave of absence was gotten to by a little bit of configuration about how best to maximize the time we have with Kate in the spring and um, allow her to serve. Um, so maybe I'll just start with Stephen, give a little bit of detail about what it looks like. I know it's written in there, but. Sure. Um, so uh, the, the legislature, is, as you may know, doesn't meet on Mondays. Um, and um, it also doesn't start as early in the morning as we start the school. And so um, one of the courses that Kate teaches is AP statistics, which we don't really have a replacement for. And so what we did was we've um, configured the schedule so that those kids will be able to meet in a first band class of the day. And so she will be here on full days on Mondays and then two other days the, of the week in the mornings to be able to teach the, that class. Where then uh, her other classes, we have a long-term sub that we've uh, hired to be able to take some of her classes as well so that um, we can do that. When you start adding up all of the hours um, that she would be able to be here when the legislature's not in session and when she's here teaching, plus the time that she's already spent teaching this year and will teach after the session. Um, what that comes up to is about a 0.25 leave of absence. So in other words, she's giving us 0.75 of her 
total 1.0 FTE um, for teaching throughout this school year. And so we have a long-term sub to cover for her other classes and we she's going to actually help that long-term sub plan for classes on the Mondays that she's here. So we have plenty of work to do around here. Uh, let's not worry about us working somebody. And so it will work out okay for us. It's just kind of an unusual situation that we might have to consider how we do differently the following year when we have, because we'll have more advanced notice um, because, you know, she's on a two-year term. So we'll just have more time to plan for the following year. And so the leave might look a little different for that one. Thank you for that clarification. I didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> Lindy, and go ahead. Yeah, I just had a, the long-term sub will be full-time. Is that right, Stephen? Yes, because we have more than just the uh -huh. need to fill Kate's position, as you guys might have remembered, I'm teaching right now in math as well. And so it, um, with the return of a teacher who has been out on sick leave and Kate going out on this, everything kind of works out now for us so that we'll have uh, the long term sub covering some stuff and we'll be OK going forward. You won't be having to teach math. Not right now in the second semester, I get to just be a full-time principal, um, which uh, given the length of these meetings is more than a full-time job. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, we, we deserve it. It's okay. All right. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Any abstention? Any no's? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Megan, back to you. Uh, any update on vacancies besides the one that we I, just heard? <laughs> yes, I would just reiterate what we said last time, which is U32 continues to experience the most pain in support staff, maintenance, uh, food service. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, it, it is not new information from before. It's been really tough. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Stephen, and everybody at U32. Have you thought of taking up um, Chris's offer to drive the uh, mopping machine, whatever <laughs> that machine is called? He said he would do that, so I think we should. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It might be a liability, <laughs> Diane. I might, like, you know. Take some classes. Got okay. uh, moving right on into. We have an executive session. Uh, I wanna uh, also try to let go people that don't need to stay for the uh, for the executive session. So after executive session, we have board reflection, and we're pretty. Uh, and we have future agenda items. Uh, I think the main thing is going to be uh, a future meeting. So. I want to say that let's go ahead and have an executive session, but Lisa and everybody else, you know, that doesn't need to be inside executive session, please feel free to go. Thank Unless you. I'm missing something, guys. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, all principals, administrators, community members. It was great. We are down to 36 people, but it was pretty impressive. Uh, thank you, Jess and Kat, Michelle. I, I see you all. I can't see everybody. Thank you, Jess. I know. Yes, you thank you are... all for staying tonight and also your dedication. The staff appreciation goes to you all as well. You know, the administrator in the central office and all the dedicated people. And so hope you have time with families and time to be um, off the clock, so to speak. Yes. Thank you. I have the you. ready whenever you're ready, Floor. Just let me know. Okay. And, uh, uh, I, I move. Go ahead. I'm about to move. I'm, I move that we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiation strategy. Second. Who was that? That was me. Daniel. I got. Oh it. no, you, Joshua, you got it. Okay. You got uh, it. Who needs to be included? Oh, uh, and, to in, to include Megan. Megan. Okay. You got that, Lisa? I I got it. You got it. Okay. Thank you, Amy. I see still. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Oops. I missed the. We have a motion to.
adjourn. I, I don't think anybody has the bandwidth unless you want to. Well, I guess we could reflect on the meeting today. It was it, it, it was hard, but I think we did a good job. It was a hard meeting and we can always improve. But thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, David, for sticking the core for sticking with us. Thank you, Orca Media. Good night, everybody. You have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you. Who seconded? Natasha. Everybody. You? Everybody seconded. Natasha seconded. All those in favor, please signify by Aye. leaving. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Floor, who is Happy the second? Happy holidays to everybody. Floor, who is the second on that last one? Natasha, I think. Thank Natasha, you. second it.